The Dark Cosmos presents The Land That Time Forgot, written by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This classic dark sci-fi tale was first published in August of 1918 in the Blue Book magazine. Sit back, relax, and unwind for the next several hours as we delve into a faraway land filled with prehistoric creatures that undergo individual metamorphosis. Are you ready? As you immerse yourself in the story, always remember to stay cosmic. Let's begin. Chapter 1 It must have been a little after three o'clock in the afternoon that it happened, the afternoon of June 3rd, 1916. It seems incredible that all that I have passed through, all those weird and terrifying experiences, should have been encompassed within so short a span as three brief months Rather, might I have experienced a cosmic cycle with all its changes and evolutions for that which I have seen with my own eyes in this brief interval of time, things that no other mortal eye had seen before, glimpses of a world past, a world dead, a world so long dead that even in the lowest Cambrian stratum no trace of it remains. Fused with the melting inner crust, it has passed forever beyond the ken of man other than in that lost pocket of the earth, whither fate has borne me, and where my doom is sealed. I am here, and here must remain. After reading this far, my interest, which already had been stimulated by the finding of the manuscript, was approaching the boiling point. I had come to Greenland for the summer, on the advice of my physician, and was slowly being bored to extinction, as I had thoughtlessly neglected to bring sufficient reading matter. Being an indifferent fisherman, my enthusiasm for this form of sport soon waned, yet in the absence of other forms of recreation, I was now risking my life in an entirely inadequate boat off Cape Farewell at the southernmost extremity of Greenland. Greenland. As a descriptive appellation, it is a sorry joke. But my story has nothing to do with Greenland, nothing to do with me, so I shall get through with the one and the other as rapidly as possible. The inadequate boat finally arrived at a precarious landing, the natives waist-deep in the surf, assisting. I was carried ashore, and while the evening meal was being prepared, I wandered to and fro along the rocky, shattered shore. Bits of surf-harried beach clove the worn granite or whatever the rocks of Cape Farewell may be composed of, and as I followed the ebbing tide down one of these soft stretches, I saw the thing. Were one to bump into a Bengal tiger in the ravine behind the Bimini Baths, one could be no more surprised than was I to see a perfectly good quart thermos bottle turning and twisting in the surf of Cape Farewell at the southern extremity of Greenland. I rescued it but I was soaked above the knees doing it, and then I sat down in the sand and opened it, and in the long twilight read the manuscript, neatly written and tightly folded, which was its contents. You have read the opening paragraph, and if you are an imaginative idiot like myself, you will want to read the rest of it, so I shall give it to you here, omitting quotation marks, which are difficult of remembrance. In two minutes you will forget me. My home is in Santa Monica. I am, or was, junior member of my father's firm. We are shipbuilders. Of recent years we have specialized on submarines, which we have built for Germany, England, France, and the United States. I know a sub as a mother knows her baby's face, and have commanded a score of them on their trial runs. Yet my inclinations were all toward aviation. I graduated under Curtis and after a long siege with my father, obtained his permission to try for the Lafayette Escadrille. As a stepping stone, I obtained an appointment in the American Ambulance Service and was on my way to France when three shrill whistles altered in as many seconds my entire scheme of life. I was sitting on deck with some of the fellows who were going into the American Ambulance Service with me, my Airedale, Crown Prince Nobler, asleep at my feet, when the first blast of the whistle shattered the peace and security of the ship. Ever since entering the U-boat zone, we had been on the lookout for periscopes and children that we were, bemoaning the unkind fate that was to see us safely into France on the morrow without a glimpse of the dread marauders. We were young, we craved thrills, and God knows we got them that day, 
Yet by comparison with that through which I have since passed, they were as tame as a Punch and Judy show. I shall never forget the ashy faces of the passengers as they stampeded for their life belts, though there was no panic. Nobs rose with a low growl. I rose also, and over the ship's side, I saw not two hundred yards distant the periscope of a submarine, while racing toward the liner the wake of a torpedo was distinctly visible. We were aboard an American ship, which of course was not armed. We were entirely defenseless, yet without warning, we were being torpedoed. I stood rigid, spellbound, watching the white wake of the torpedo. It struck us on the starboard side almost amidships. The vessel rocked as though the sea beneath it had been uptorn by a mighty volcano. We were thrown to the decks, bruised and stunned, and then above the ship, carrying with it fragments of steel and wood and dismembered human bodies, rose a column of water hundreds of feet into the air. The silence which followed the detonation of the exploding torpedo was almost equally horrifying. It lasted for perhaps two seconds, to be followed by the screams and moans of the wounded, the cursing of the men, and the hoarse commands of the ship's officers. They were splendid, they and their crew. Never before had I been so proud of my nationality as I was that moment. In all the chaos which followed the torpedoing of the liner, no officer or member of the crew lost his head, or showed in the slightest any degree of panic or fear. While we were attempting to lower boats, the submarine emerged and trained guns on us. The officer in command ordered us to lower our flag, but this the captain of the liner refused to do. The ship was listing frightfully to starboard, rendering the port boats useless, while half the starboard boats had been demolished by the explosion. Even while the passengers were crowding the starboard rail and scrambling into the few boats left to us, the submarine commenced shelling the ship. I saw one shell burst in a group of women and children, and then I turned my head and covered my eyes. When I looked again to horror was added chagrin, for with the emerging of the U-boat I had recognized her as a product of our own shipyard. I knew her to a rivet. I had superintended her construction. I had sat in that very conning tower and directed the efforts of the sweating crew below when first her prow clove the sunny summer waters of the Pacific. And now this creature of my brain and hand had turned Frankenstein, bent upon pursuing me to my death. A second shell exploded upon the deck. One of the lifeboats, frightfully overcrowded, swung at a dangerous angle from its davits. A fragment of the shell shattered the bow tackle, and I saw the women and children and the men vomited into the sea beneath, while the boat dangled stern up for a moment from its single davit, and at last, with increasing momentum, dived into the midst of the struggling victims, screaming upon the face of the waters. Now I saw men spring to the rail and leap into the ocean. The deck was tilting to an impossible angle. Nobs braced himself with all four feet to keep from slipping into the scuppers and looked up into my face with a questioning whine. I stooped and stroked his head. Come on, boy, I cried, and running to the side of the ship, dived head foremost over the rail. When I came up, the first thing I saw was Nobs swimming about in a bewildered sort of way a few yards from me. At sight of me, his ears went flat and his lips parted in a characteristic grin. The submarine was withdrawing toward the north, but all the time it was shelling the open boats, three of them loaded to the gunwales with survivors. Fortunately, the small boats presented a rather poor target which, combined with the bad marksmanship of the Germans, preserved their occupants from harm, and after a few minutes a blotch of smoke appeared upon the eastern horizon, and the U-boat submerged and disappeared. All the time the lifeboats had been pulling away from the danger of the sinking liner, and now, though I yelled at the top of my lungs, they either did not hear my appeals for help, or else did not dare return to succour me. Nobs and I had gained some little distance from the ship when it rolled completely over and sank. We were caught in the suction only enough to be drawn backward a few yards, neither of us being carried beneath the surface. I glanced hurriedly about for something to which to cling. My eyes were directed toward the point at which the liner had disappeared when there came from the depths of the ocean the muffled reverberation of an explosion 
and almost simultaneously a geyser of water in which were shattered lifeboats, human bodies, steam, coal, oil, and the flotsam of a liner's deck leaped high above the surface of the sea, a watery column momentarily marking the grave of another ship in this greatest cemetery of the seas. When the turbulent waters had somewhat subsided and the sea had ceased to spew up wreckage, I ventured to swim back in search of something substantial enough to support my weight and that of Nobbs as well. I had gotten well over the area of the wreck, when not a half dozen yards ahead of me a lifeboat shot bow foremost out of the ocean, almost its entire length to flop down upon its keel with a mighty splash. It must have been carried far below, held to its mothership by a single rope, which finally parted to the enormous strain put upon it. In no other way can I account for its having leaped so far out of the water, a beneficent circumstance to which I doubtless owe my life, and that of another far dearer to me than my own. I say beneficent circumstance even in the face of the fact that a fate far more hideous confronts us than that which we escaped that day. For because of that circumstance, I have met her whom otherwise I never should have known. I have met and loved her. At least I have had that great happiness in life, nor can Kaspak, with all her horrors, expunge that which has been. So for the thousandth time I thank the strange fate which sent that lifeboat hurtling upward from the green pit of destruction to which it had been dragged, sent it far up above the surface, emptying its water as it rose above the waves and dropping it upon the surface of the sea, buoyant and safe. It did not take me long to clamber over its side and drag Nobs into comparative safety, and then I glanced around upon the scene of death and desolation which surrounded us. The sea was littered with wreckage among which floated the pitiful forms of women and children buoyed up by their useless life belts. Some were torn and mangled, others lay rolling quietly to the motion of the sea, their countenances composed and peaceful, others were set in hideous lines of agony or horror. Close to the boat's side floated the figure of a girl. Her face was turned upward, held above the surface by her life belt, and was framed in a floating mass of dark and waving hair. She was very beautiful. I had never looked upon such perfect features, such a divine moulding which was at the same time human, intensely human. It was a face filled with character and strength and femininity, the face of one who was created to love and to be loved. The cheeks were flushed to the hue of life and health and vitality, and yet she lay there upon the bosom of the sea, dead. I felt something rise in my throat as I looked down upon that radiant vision, and I swore that I should live to avenge her murder. And then I let my eyes drop once more to the face upon the water, and what I saw nearly tumbled me backward into the sea, for the eyes in the dead face had opened. The lips had parted, and one hand was raised toward me in a mute appeal for succor. She lived. She was not dead. I leaned over the boat's side and drew her quickly into the comparative safety which God had given me. I removed her life belt and my soggy coat and made a pillow for her head. I chafed her hands and arms and feet. I worked over her for an hour, and at last I was rewarded by a deep sigh, and again those great eyes opened and looked into mine. At that I was all embarrassment. I have never been a ladies' man. At Leland Stanford, I was the butt of the class because of my hopeless imbecility in the presence of a pretty girl. But the men liked me nevertheless. I was rubbing one of her hands when she opened her eyes, and I dropped it as though it were a red-hot rivet. Those eyes took me in slowly from head to foot. Then they wandered slowly around the horizon marked by the rising and falling gunwales of the lifeboat. They looked at knobs and softened, and then came back to me filled with questioning. I, I, I stammered, moving away and stumbling over the next thwart. The vision smiled wanly. I, I, sir, she replied faintly, and again her lips drooped, and her long lashes swept the firm, fair texture of her skin. I hope that you are feeling better, I finally managed to say. Do you know, she said after a moment of silence, I have been awake for a long time, but I did not dare open my eyes. 
I thought I must be dead, and I was afraid to look, for fear that I should see nothing but blackness about me. I'm afraid to die. Tell me what happened after the ship went down. I remember all that happened before. Oh, but I wish that I might forget it. A sob broke her voice. The beasts, she went on after a moment. And to think that I was to have married one of them, a lieutenant in the German Navy. Presently she resumed as though she had not ceased speaking. I went down and down and down. I thought I should never cease to sink. I felt no particular distress until I suddenly started upward at ever-increasing velocity. Then my lungs seemed about to burst, and I must have lost consciousness, for I remember nothing more until I opened my eyes after listening to a torrent of invective against Germany and Germans. Tell me, please, all that happened after the ship sank. I told her then, as well as I could, all that I had seen, the submarine shelling the open boats and all the rest of it. She thought it marvellous that we should have been spared in so providential a manner, and I had a pretty speech upon my tongue's end, but lacked the nerve to deliver it. Nobbs had come over and nosed his muzzle into her lap, and she stroked his ugly face, and at last she leaned over and put her cheek against his forehead. I have always admired Nobbs, but this was the first time that it had ever occurred to me that I might wish to be Nobbs. I wondered how he would take it, for he is as unused to women as I but he took to it as a duck takes to water. What I lack of being a lady's man, Nobbs certainly makes up for as a lady's dog. The old scalawag just closed his eyes and put on one of the softest, sugar-wouldn't-melt-in-my-mouth expressions you ever saw, and stood there taking it and asking for more. It made me jealous. You seem fond of dogs, I said. I am fond of this dog, she replied. Whether she meant anything personal in that reply, I did not know, but I took it as personal, and it made me feel mighty good. As we drifted about upon that vast expanse of loneliness, it is not strange that we should quickly become well acquainted. Constantly, we scanned the horizon for signs of smoke, venturing guesses as to our chances of rescue. But darkness settled, and the black night enveloped us without ever the sight of a speck upon the waters. We were thirsty, hungry, uncomfortable, and cold. Our wet garments had dried but little, and I knew that the girl must be in grave danger from the exposure to a night of cold and wet upon the water in an open boat, without sufficient clothing and no food. I had managed to bail all the water out of the boat with cupped hands, ending by mopping the balance up with my handkerchief. A slow and back-breaking procedure. Thus, I had made a comparatively dry place for the girl to lie down low in the bottom of the boat, where the sides would protect her from the night wind, and when at last she did so, almost overcome as she was by weakness and fatigue, I threw my wet coat over her further to thwart the chill. But it was of no avail. As I sat watching her, the moonlight marking out the graceful curves of her slender young body, I saw her shiver. Isn't there something I can do? I asked. You can't lie there chilled through all night. Can't you suggest something? She shook her head. We must grin and bear it, she replied after a moment. Nobbler came and lay down on the thwart beside me, his back against my leg, and I sat staring in dumb misery at the girl, knowing in my heart of hearts that she might die before morning came, for what with the shock and exposure, she had already gone through enough to kill almost any woman. And as I gazed down at her, so small and delicate and helpless, there was born slowly within my breast a new emotion. It had never been there before. Now it will never cease to be there. It made me almost frantic in my desire to find some way to keep warm the cooling lifeblood in her veins. I was cold myself, though I had almost forgotten it, until Nobler moved, and I felt a new sensation of cold along my leg against which he had lain, and suddenly realized that in that one spot I had been warm. Like a great light came the understanding of a means to warm the girl. Immediately I knelt beside her to put my scheme into practice, when suddenly I was overwhelmed with embarrassment. Would she permit it, even if I could muster the courage to suggest it? Then I saw her frame convulse, shudderingly, her muscles reacting to her rapidly lowering temperature and casting prudery to the winds, 
I threw myself down beside her and took her in my arms, pressing her body close to mine. She drew away suddenly, voicing a little cry of fright, and tried to push me from her. Forgive me, I managed to stammer. It is the only way. You will die of exposure if you are not warmed, and Nobbs and I are the only means we can command for furnishing warmth. And I held her tightly while I called Nobbs and bade him lie down at her back. The girl didn't struggle any more when she learned my purpose, but she gave two or three little gasps and then began to cry softly, burying her face on my arm, and thus she fell asleep. Chapter 2 Toward morning I must have dozed, though it seemed to me at the time that I had lain awake for days instead of hours. When I finally opened my eyes, it was daylight, and the girl's hair was in my face, and she was breathing normally. I thanked God for that. She had turned her head during the night, so that as I opened my eyes, I saw her face not an inch from mine, my lips almost touching hers. It was Nobbs who finally awoke her. He got up, stretched, turned around a few times and lay down again, and the girl opened her eyes and looked into mine. Hers went very wide at first, and then slowly comprehension came to her, and she smiled. You have been very good to me, she said, as I helped her to rise, though if the truth were known, I was more in need of assistance than she. The circulation all along my left side seeming to be paralyzed entirely. You have been very good to me, and that was the only mention she ever made of it. Yet I know that she was thankful, and that only reserve prevented her from referring to what, to say the least, was an embarrassing situation, however unavoidable. Shortly after daylight, we saw smoke apparently coming straight toward us, and after a time we made out the squat lines of a tug, one of those fearless exponents of England's supremacy of the sea that tows sailing ships into French and English ports. I stood up on a thwart and waved my soggy coat above my head. Nobbs stood upon another and barked. The girl sat at my feet, straining her eyes toward the deck of the oncoming boat. They see us, she said at last. There is a man answering your signal. She was right. A lump came into my throat, for her sake rather than for mine. She was saved, and none too soon. She could not have lived through another night upon the channel. She might not have lived through the coming day. The tug came close beside us, and a man on deck threw us a rope. Willing hands dragged us to the deck, knobs scrambling nimbly aboard without assistance. The rough men were gentle as mothers with the girl. Plying us both with questions, they hustled her to the captain's cabin and me to the boiler room. They told the girl to take off her wet clothes and throw them outside the door that they might be dried, and then to slip into the captain's bunk and get warm. They didn't have to tell me to strip after I once got into the warmth of the boiler room. In a jiffy, my clothes hung about where they might dry most quickly, and I myself was absorbing through every pore the welcome heat of the stifling compartment. They brought us hot soup and coffee, and then those who were not on duty sat around and helped me damn the Kaiser and his brood. As soon as our clothes were dry, they bade us don them, as the chances were always more than fair in those waters that we should run into trouble with the enemy, as I was only too well aware. What with the warmth and the feeling of safety for the girl, and the knowledge that a little rest and food would quickly overcome the effects of her experiences of the past dismal hours, I was feeling more content than I had experienced since those three whistle blasts had shattered the peace of my world the previous afternoon. But peace upon the channel has been but a transitory thing since August 1914. It proved itself such that morning, for I had scarce gotten into my dry clothes and taken the girl's apparel to the captain's cabin when an order was shouted down into the engine room for full speed ahead, and an instant later I heard the dull boom of a gun. In a moment, I was up on deck to see an enemy submarine about two hundred yards off our port bow. She had signalled us to stop, and our skipper had ignored the order, but now she had her gun trained on us, and the second shot grazed the cabin, warning the belligerent tug captain that it was time to obey. Once again, an order went down to the engine room, and the tug reduced speed. 
The U-boat ceased firing and ordered the tug to come about and approach. Our momentum had carried us a little beyond the enemy craft, but we were turning now on the arc of a circle that would bring us alongside her. As I stood watching the maneuver and wondering what was to become of us, I felt something touch my elbow and turned to see the girl standing at my side. She looked up into my face with a rueful expression. They seem bent on our destruction, she said, and it looks like the same boat that sunk us yesterday. It is, I replied. I know her well. I helped design her and took her out on her first run. The girl drew back from me with a little exclamation of surprise and disappointment. I thought you were an American, she said. I had no idea you were a... a... Uh, nor am I, I replied. Americans have been building submarines for all nations for many years. I wish, though, that we had gone bankrupt, my father and I, before ever we turned out that Frankenstein of a thing. We were approaching the U-boat at half speed now, and I could almost distinguish the features of the men upon her deck. A sailor stepped to my side and slipped something hard and cold into my hand. I did not have to look at it to know that it was a heavy pistol. Tyka, an user, was all he said. Our bow was pointed straight toward the U-boat now, as I heard word pass to the engine for full speed ahead. I instantly grasped the brazen effrontery of the plucky English skipper. He was going to ram five hundred tons of U-boat in the face of her trained gun. I could scarce repress a cheer. At first the Bosch didn't seem to grasp his intention. Evidently they thought they were witnessing an exhibition of poor seamanship, and they yelled their warnings to the tug to reduce speed and throw the helm hard to port. We were within fifty feet of them when they awakened to the intentional menace of our maneuver. Their gun crew was off its guard, but they sprang to their piece now and sent a futile shell above our heads. Nobs lapped about and barked furiously. Let them have it, commanded the tug captain, and instantly revolvers and rifles poured bullets upon the deck of the submersible. Two of the gun crew went down. The other trained their piece at the waterline of the oncoming tug. The balance of those on deck replied to our small arms fire, directing their efforts toward the man at our wheel. I hastily pushed the girl down the companionway leading to the engine room, then I raised my pistol and fired my first shot at a Bosch. What happened in the next few seconds happened so quickly that details are rather blurred in my memory. I saw the helmsman lunge forward upon the wheel, pulling the helm around so that the tug sheared off quickly from her course, and I recall realizing that all our efforts were to be in vain because of all the men aboard. Fate had decreed that this one should fall first to an enemy bullet. I saw the depleted gun crew on the submarine fire their piece, and I felt the shock of impact, and heard the loud explosion as the shell struck and exploded in our bows. I saw and realized these things even as I was leaping into the pilot house and grasping the wheel, standing astride the dead body of the helmsman. With all my strength, I threw the helm to starboard, but it was too late to affect the purpose of our skipper. The best I did was to scrape alongside the sub. I heard someone shriek an order into the engine room. The boat shuddered and trembled to the sudden reversing of the engines, and our speed quickly lessened. Then I saw what that madman of a skipper planned, since his first scheme had gone wrong. With a loud yelled command, he leaped to the slippery deck of the submersible, and at his heels came his hardy crew. I sprang from the pilot house and followed, not to be left out in the cold when it came to strafing the Bosch. From the engine room companionway came the engineer and stockers, and together we leaped after the balance of the crew and into the hand-to-hand -hand fight that was covering the wet deck with red blood. Beside me came Nobs, silent now and grim. Germans were emerging from the open hatch to take part in the battle on deck. At first, the pistols cracked amidst the cursing of the men and the loud commands of the commander and his junior. But presently, we were too indiscriminately mixed to make it safe to use our firearms, and the battle resolved itself into a hand-to-hand -hand struggle for possession of the deck. The sole aim of each of us was to hurl one of the opposing force into the sea. I shall never forget the hideous expression upon the face of the great Prussian with whom chance confronted me. He lowered his head and rushed at me, bellowing like a bull, with a quick sidestep 
and ducking low beneath his outstretched arms, I eluded him, and as he turned to come back at me, I landed a blow upon his chin, which sent him spinning toward the edge of the deck. I saw his wild endeavors to regain his equilibrium. I saw him reel drunkenly for an instant upon the brink of eternity, and then, with a loud scream, slip into the sea. At the same instant, a pair of giant arms encircled me from behind and lifted me entirely off my feet. Kick and squirm as I would, I could neither turn toward my antagonist nor free myself from his maniacal grasp. Relentlessly, he was rushing me toward the side of the vessel and death. There was none to stay him, for each of my companions was more than occupied by from one to three of the enemy. For an instant, I was fearful for myself, and then I saw that which filled me with a far greater terror for another. My Bosch was bearing me toward the side of the submarine against which the tug was still pounding. That I should be ground to death between the two was lost upon me, as I saw the girl standing alone upon the tug's deck, as I saw the stern high in air, and the bow rapidly settling for the final dive, as I saw death from which I could not save her clutching at the skirts of the woman I now knew all too well that I loved. I had perhaps the fraction of a second longer to live when I heard an angry growl behind us mingle with a cry of pain and rage from the giant who carried me. Instantly, he went backward to the deck, and as he did so, he threw his arms outwards to save himself, freeing me. I fell heavily upon him, but was upon my feet in the instant. As I arose, I cast a single glance at my opponent. Never again would he menace me or another, for Nob's great jaws had closed upon his throat. Then I sprang toward the edge of the deck, closest to the girl upon the sinking tug. Jump! I cried. Jump! And I held out my arms to her. Instantly, as though with implicit confidence in my ability to save her, she leaped over the side of the tug onto the sloping, slippery side of the U-boat. I reached far over to seize her hand. At the same instant, the tug pointed its stern straight toward the sky and plunged out of sight. My hand missed the girl's by a fraction of an inch, and I saw her slip into the sea, but scarce had she touched the water when I was in after her. The sinking tug drew us far below the surface, but I had seized her the moment I struck the water, and so we went down together, and together we came up, a few yards from the U-boat. The first thing I heard was Nobs barking furiously. Evidently he had missed me and was searching. A single glance at the vessel's deck assured me that the battle was over, and that we had been victorious, for I saw our survivors holding a handful of the enemy at pistol points while one by one the rest of the crew was coming out of the craft's interior and lining up on deck with the other prisoners. As I swam toward the submarine with the girl, Nob's persistent barking attracted the attention of some of the tug's crew, so that, as soon as we reached the side, there were hands to help us aboard. I asked the girl if she was hurt, but she assured me that she was none the worse for this second wetting, nor did she seem to suffer any from shock. I was to learn for myself that this slender and seemingly delicate creature possessed the heart and courage of a warrior. As we joined our own party, I found the tug's mate checking up our survivors. There were ten of us left, not including the girl. Our brave skipper was missing, as were eight others. There had been nineteen of us in the attacking party, and we had accounted in one way and another during the battle for sixteen Germans and had taken nine prisoners, including the commander. His lieutenant had been killed. Not a bad day's work, said Bradley, the mate, when he had completed his role. Only losing the skipper, he added, was the worst. He was a fine man, a fine man. Olsen, who in spite of his name was Irish, and in spite of his not being Scotch had been the tug's engineer, was standing with Bradley and me. Yes, he agreed. It's a day's work we're after doing, but what are we going to be doing with it now we got it? We'll run her into the nearest English port, said Bradley, and then we'll all go ashore and get our VCS, he concluded, laughing. How are you going to run her? queried Olsen. You can't trust these Dutchmen. Bradley scratched his head. I guess you're right, he admitted. And I don't know the first thing about a sub. I do, I assured him. I know more about this particular sub than the officer who commanded her. 
Both men looked at me in astonishment, and then I had to explain all over again as I'd explained to the girl. Bradley and Olsen were delighted. Immediately I was put in command, and the first thing I did was to go below with Olsen and inspect the craft thoroughly for hidden Bosch and damaged machinery. There were no Germans below, and everything was intact and in shipshape working order. I then ordered all hands below except one man who was to act as lookout. Questioning the Germans, I found that all except the commander were willing to resume their posts and aid in bringing the vessel into an English port. I believe that they were relieved at the prospect of being detained at a comfortable English prison camp for the duration of the war after the perils and privations through which they had passed. The officer, however, assured me that he would never be a party to the capture of his vessel. There was, therefore, nothing to do but put the man in irons. As we were preparing to put this decision into force, the girl descended from the deck. It was the first time that she or the German officer had seen each other's faces since we had boarded the U-boat. I was assisting the girl down the ladder and still retained a hold upon her arm, possibly after such support was no longer necessary, when she turned and looked squarely into the face of the German. Each voiced a sudden exclamation of surprise and dismay. Lise! he cried, and took a step toward her. The girl's eyes went wide and slowly filled with a great horror as she shrank back. Then her slender figure stiffened to the erectness of a soldier, and with chin in air, and without a word, she turned her back upon the officer. Take him away, I directed the two men who guarded him, and put him in irons. When he had gone, the girl raised her eyes to mine. He is the German of whom I spoke, she said. He is Baron von Schoenwort. I merely inclined my head. She had loved him. I wondered if in her heart of hearts she did not love him yet. Immediately, I became insanely jealous. I hated Baron Friedrich von Schoenwort with such utter intensity that the emotion thrilled me with a species of exultation but I didn't have much chance to enjoy my hatred then, for almost immediately the lookout poked his face over the hatchway and bawled down that there was smoke on the horizon, dead ahead. Immediately I went on deck to investigate, and Bradley came with me. If she's friendly, he said, we'll speak her. If she's not, we'll sink her. Eh, Captain? Yes, Lieutenant, I replied, and it was his turn to smile. We hoisted the Union Jack and remained on deck, asking Bradley to go below and assign to each member of the crew his duty, placing one Englishman with a pistol beside each German. Half speed ahead, I commanded. More rapidly now, we closed the distance between ourselves and the stranger until I could plainly see the red ensign of the British Merchant Marine. My heart swelled with pride at the thought that presently admiring British tars would be congratulating us upon our notable capture. And just about then, the merchant steamer must have sighted us, for she veered suddenly toward the north, and a moment later, dense volumes of smoke issued from her funnels. Then, steering a zigzag course, she fled from us as though we had been the bubonic plague. I altered the course of the submarine and set off in chase, but the steamer was faster than we, and soon left us hopelessly astern. With a rueful smile, I directed that our original course be resumed, and once again we set off toward Merry England. That was three months ago, and we haven't arrived yet, nor is there any likelihood that we ever shall. The steamer we had just sighted must have wirelessed a warning, for it wasn't half an hour before we saw more smoke on the horizon, and this time the vessel flew the white ensign of the Royal Navy and carried guns. She didn't veer to the north or anywhere else, but bore down on us rapidly. I was just preparing to signal her when a flame flashed from her bows, and an instant later the water in front of us was thrown high by the explosion of a shell. Bradley had come on deck and was standing beside me. About one more of those, and she'll have our range, he said. She doesn't seem to take much stock in our Union Jack. A second shell passed over us, and then I gave the command to change our direction, at the same time directing Bradley to go below and give the order to submerge. I passed Nobbs down to him, and following, saw to the closing and fastening of the hatch. 
It seemed to me that the diving tanks never had filled so slowly. We heard a loud explosion apparently directly above us. The craft trembled to the shock which threw us all to the deck. I expected momentarily to feel the deluge of inrushing water, but none came. Instead, we continued to submerge until the manometer registered 40 feet, and then I knew that we were safe. Safe? I almost smiled. I had relieved Olsen, who had remained in the tower at my direction, having been a member of one of the early British submarine crews, and therefore having some knowledge of the business. Bradley was at my side. He looked at me quizzically. What the devil are we to do? he asked. The merchantman will flee us. The war vessel will destroy us. Neither will believe our colours or give us a chance to explain. We will meet even a worse reception if we go nosing around a British port, mines, nets, and all of it. We can't do it. Let's try it again when this fellow has lost the scent, I urged. There must come a ship that will believe us. And try it again we did, only to be almost rammed by a huge freighter. Later, we were fired upon by a destroyer, and two merchantmen turned and fled at our approach. For two days, we cruised up and down the channel trying to tell someone who would listen that we were friends. But no one would listen. After our encounter with the first warship, I had given instructions that a wireless message be sent out explaining our predicament. But to my chagrin, I discovered that both sending and receiving instruments had disappeared. There is only one place you can go, von Schoenvort sent word to me, and that is Kiel. You can't land anywhere else in these waters. If you wish, I will take you there, and I can promise that you will be treated well. There is another place we can go, I sent back my reply, and we will before we'll go to Germany. That place is hell. Chapter 3 Those were anxious days during which I had but little opportunity to associate with Liss. I had given her the commander's room, Bradley and I taking that of the deck officer, while Olsen and two of our best men occupied the room ordinarily allotted to petty officers. I made Nob's bed down in Lise's room, for I knew she would feel less alone. Nothing of much moment occurred for a while after we left British waters behind us. We ran steadily along upon the surface, making good time. The first two boats we sighted made off as fast as they could go, and the third, a huge freighter, fired on us, forcing us to submerge. It was after this that our troubles commenced. One of the diesel engines broke down in the morning, and while we were working on it, the forward port diving tank commenced to fill. I was on deck at the time and noted the gradual list. Guessing at once what was happening, I leapt for the hatch and, slamming it closed above my head, dropped to the centrale. By this time the craft was going down by the head with a most unpleasant list to port, and I didn't wait to transmit orders to someone else, but ran as fast as I could for the valve that let the sea into the forward port diving tank. It was wide open. To close it and to have the pump started that would empty it were the work of but a minute but we had had a close call. I knew that the valve had never opened itself. Someone had opened it, someone who was willing to die himself if he might at the same time encompass the death of all of us. After that, I kept a guard pacing the length of the narrow craft. We worked upon the engine all that day and night and half the following day. Most of the time we drifted idly upon the surface, but toward noon we sighted smoke due west and having found that only enemies inhabited the world for us, I ordered that the other engine be started so that we could move out of the path of the oncoming steamer. The moment the engine started to turn, however, there was a grinding sound of tortured steel, and when it had been stopped, we found that someone had placed a cold chisel in one of the gears. It was another two days before we were ready to limp along, half repaired. The night before the repairs were completed, the sentry came to my room and awoke me. He was rather an intelligent fellow of the English middle class, in whom I had much confidence. Well, Wilson, I asked, what's the matter now? He raised his finger to his lips and came closer to me. I think I found out who's doing the mischief, he whispered, and nodded his head toward the girl's room. I seen her sneaking from the crew's room just now, he went on. 
She'd been in gassing with the Bosch commander. Benson seen her in there last night too, but he never said nothing till I goes on watch tonight. Benson sort her slow in the head, and he never puts two and two together till someone else has made four out of it. If the man had come in and struck me suddenly in the face, I could have been no more surprised. Say nothing of this to anyone, I ordered. Keep your eyes and ears open and report every suspicious thing you see or hear. The man saluted and left me, but for an hour or more I tossed, restless upon my hard bunk in an agony of jealousy and fear. Finally, I fell into a troubled sleep. It was daylight when I awoke. We were steaming along slowly upon the surface, my orders having been to proceed at half speed until we could take an observation and determine our position. The sky had been overcast all the previous day and all night, but as I stepped into the centrale that morning, I was delighted to see that the sun was again shining. The spirits of the men seemed improved. Everything seemed propitious. I forgot at once the cruel misgivings of the past night as I set to work to take my observations. What a blow awaited me. The sextant and chronometer had both been broken beyond repair, and they had been broken just this very night. They had been broken upon the night that Liss had been seen talking with von Schönwort. I think that it was this last thought which hurt me the worst. I could look the other disaster in the face with equanimity, but the bald fact that Liss might be a traitor appalled me. I called Bradley and Olsen on deck and told them what had happened, but for the life of me, I couldn't bring myself to repeat what Wilson had reported to me the previous night. In fact, as I had given the matter thought, it seemed incredible that the girl could have passed through my room, in which Bradley and I slept, and then carried on a conversation in the crew's room, in which von Schoenvorts was kept, without having been seen by more than a single man. Bradley shook his head. I can't make it out, he said. One of those Bosch must be pretty clever to come it over us all like this, but they haven't harmed us as much as they think. There are still the extra instruments. It was my turn now to shake a doleful head. There are no extra instruments, I told them. They too have disappeared, as did the wireless apparatus. Both men looked at me in amazement. We still have the compass and the sun, said Olsen. They may be after getting the compass some night, but there's too many of us around in the daytime for him to get the sun. It was then that one of the men stuck his head up through the hatchway and, seeing me, asked permission to come on deck and get a breath of fresh air. I recognized him as Benson, the man who, Wilson had said, reported having seen Liss with von Schoenvorts two nights before. I motioned him on deck and then called him to one side, asking if he had seen anything out of the way or unusual during his trick on watch the night before. The fellow scratched his head a moment and said, No. And then, as though it was an afterthought, he told me that he had seen the girl in the crew's room about midnight talking with the German commander, but as there hadn't seemed to him to be any harm in that, he hadn't said anything about it, telling him never to fail to report to me anything in the slightest out of the ordinary routine of the ship, I dismissed him. Several of the other men now asked permission to come on deck, and soon all but those actually engaged in some necessary duty were standing around smoking and talking, all in the best of spirits. I took advantage of the absence of the men upon the deck to go below for my breakfast, which the cook was already preparing upon the electric stove. Liss, followed by Nobbs, appeared as I entered the centrale. She met me with a pleasant, Good morning! which I am afraid I replied to in a tone that was rather constrained and surly. Will you breakfast with me? I suddenly asked the girl, determined to commence a probe of my own along the lines which duty demanded. She nodded a sweet acceptance of my invitation, and together we sat down at the little table of the officer's mess. You slept well last night? I asked. All night, she replied. I am a splendid sleeper. Her manner was so straightforward and honest that I could not bring myself to believe in her duplicity. Yet, thinking to surprise her into a betrayal of her guilt, I blurted out, The chronometer and sextant were both destroyed last night. There is a traitor among us. But she never turned a hair by way of evidencing guilty knowledge of the catastrophe. Who could it have been? she cried. 
the Germans would be crazy to do it, for their lives are as much at stake as ours. Men are often glad to die for an ideal, an ideal of patriotism, perhaps, I replied, and a willingness to martyr themselves includes a willingness to sacrifice others, even those who love them. Women are much the same, except that they will go even further than most men. They will sacrifice everything, even honor, for love. I watched her face carefully as I spoke, and I thought that I detected a very faint flush mounting her cheek. Seeing an opening and an advantage, I sought to follow it up. Take von Schoenvorts, for instance, I continued. He would doubtless be glad to die and take us all with him, could he prevent in no other way the falling of his vessel into enemy hands. He would sacrifice anyone, even you, and if you still love him, you might be his ready tool. Do you understand me? She looked at me in wide-eyed consternation for a moment, and then she went very white and rose from her seat. I do, she replied, and turning her back upon me, she walked quickly toward her room. I started to follow, for even believing what I did, I was sorry that I had hurt her. I reached the door to the crew's room just behind her, and in time to see von Schoenvorts lean forward and whisper something to her as she passed, but she must have guessed that she might be watched, for she passed on. That afternoon it clouded over, the wind mounted to a gale, and the sea rose until the craft was wallowing and rolling frightfully. Nearly everyone aboard was sick, the air became foul and oppressive. For twenty-four hours I did not leave my post in the conning tower, as both Olsen and Bradley were sick. Finally, I found that I must get a little rest, and so I looked about for someone to relieve me. Benson volunteered. He had not been sick, and assured me that he was a former RN man, and had been detailed for submarine duty for over two years. I was glad that it was he, for I had considerable confidence in his loyalty, and so it was with a feeling of security that I went below and lay down. I slept twelve hours straight, and when I awoke and discovered what I had done, I lost no time in getting to the conning tower. There sat Benson as wide awake as could be, and the compass showed that we were heading straight into the west. The storm was still raging, nor did it abate its fury until the fourth day. We were all pretty well done up, and looked forward to the time when we could go on deck and fill our lungs with fresh air. During the whole four days I had not seen the girl, as she evidently kept closely to her room, and during this time no untoward incident had occurred aboard the boat, a fact which seemed to strengthen the web of circumstantial evidence about her. For six more days after the storm lessened, we still had fairly rough weather, nor did the sun once show himself during all that time. For the season, it was now the middle of June, the storm was unusual, but being from Southern California, I was accustomed to unusual weather. In fact, I have discovered that the world over, unusual weather prevails at all times of the year. We kept steadily to our westward course, and as the U-33 was one of the fastest submersibles we had ever turned out, I knew that we must be pretty close to the North American coast. What puzzled me most was the fact that for six days we had not sighted a single ship. It seemed remarkable that we could cross the Atlantic almost to the coast of the American continent without glimpsing smoke or sail. And at last, I came to the conclusion that we were way off our course, but whether to the north or to the south of it, I could not determine. On the seventh day, the sea lay comparatively calm at early dawn. There was a slight haze upon the ocean which had cut off our view of the stars, but conditions all pointed toward a clear morrow, and I was on deck anxiously awaiting the rising of the sun. My eyes were glued upon the impenetrable mist astern, for there in the east I should see the first glow of the rising sun that would assure me we were still upon the right course. Gradually the heavens lightened, but astern I could see no intenser glow that would indicate the rising sun behind the mist. Bradley was standing at my side. Presently he touched my arm. Look, Captain, he said, and pointed south. I looked and gasped, for there directly to port I saw outlined through the haze the red top of the rising sun. Hurrying to the tower, I looked at the compass. It showed that we were holding steadily upon our westward course. Either the sun was rising in the south, 
or the compass had been tampered with. The conclusion was obvious. I went back to Bradley and told him what I had discovered. And, I concluded, we can't make another 500 knots without oil. Our provisions are running low and so is our water. God only knows how far south we have run. There is nothing to do, he replied, other than to alter our course once more toward the west. We must raise land soon or we shall all be lost. I told him to do so, and then I set to work improvising a crude sextant with which we finally took our bearings in a rough and most unsatisfactory manner. For when the work was done, we did not know how far from the truth the result might be. It showed us to be about 20 degree north and 30 degree west, nearly 2,500 miles off our course. In short, if our reading was anywhere near correct, we must have been travelling due south for six days. Bradley now relieved Benson, for we had arranged our shifts so that the latter and Olsen now divided the nights, while Bradley and I alternated with one another during the days. I questioned both Olsen and Benson closely in the matter of the compass, but each stoutly maintained that no one had tampered with it during his tour of duty. Benson gave me a knowing smile, as much as to say, Well, you and I know who did this. Yet I could not believe that it was the girl. We kept to our westerly course for several hours when the lookout's cry announced a sail. I ordered the U-33's course altered, and we bore down upon the stranger, for I had come to a decision which was the result of necessity. We could not lie there in the middle of the Atlantic and starve to death if there was any way out of it. The sailing ship saw us while we were still a long way off, as was evidenced by her efforts to escape. There was scarcely any wind, however, and her case was hopeless. So when we drew near and signalled her to stop, she came into the wind and lay there with her sails flapping idly. We moved in quite close to her. She was the Bolman of Halmstad, Sweden, with a general cargo from Brazil for Spain. I explained our circumstances to her skipper and asked for food, water and oil. But when he found that we were not German, he became very angry and abusive and started to draw away from us. But I was in no mood for any such business. Turning toward Bradley, who was in the conning tower, I snapped out, Gun service on deck, to the diving stations. We had no opportunity for drill, but every man had been posted as to his duties, and the German members of the crew understood that it was obedience or death for them as each was accompanied by a man with a pistol. Most of them, though, were only too glad to obey me. Bradley passed the order down into the ship, and a moment later the gun crew clambered up the narrow ladder and at my direction trained their piece upon the slow-moving Swede. Fire a shot across her bow, I instructed the gun captain. Accept it from me. It didn't take that Swede long to see the error of his way and get the red and white pennant signifying, I understand, to the masthead. Once again, the sails flapped idly, and then I ordered him to lower a boat and come after me. With Olsen and a couple of the Englishmen, I boarded the ship and from her cargo selected what we needed, oil, provisions and water. I gave the master of the Balman a receipt for what we took, together with an affidavit signed by Bradley, Olsen and myself, stating briefly how we had come into possession of the U-33 and the urgency of our need for what we took. We addressed both to any British agent with the request that the owners of the Balman be reimbursed, but whether or not they were, I do not know. With water, food and oil aboard, we felt that we had obtained a new lease of life. Now, too, we knew definitely where we were, and I determined to make for Georgetown, British Guiana, but I was destined to again suffer bitter disappointment. Six of us of the loyal crew had come on deck either to serve the gun or board the Swede during our set-to with her, and now, one by one, we descended the ladder into the Centrale. I was the last to come, and when I reached the bottom, I found myself looking into the muzzle of a pistol in the hands of Baron Friedrich von Schoenvorts. I saw all my men lined up at one side with the remaining eight Germans standing guard over them. I couldn't imagine how it had happened, but it had. Later, I learned that they had first overpowered Benson, who was asleep in his bunk, and taken his pistol from him. 
and then had found it an easy matter to disarm the cook and the remaining two Englishmen below. After that, it had been comparatively simple to stand at the foot of the ladder and arrest each individual as he descended. The first thing von Schoenvorts did was to send for me and announce that as a pirate, I was to be shot early the next morning. Then he explained that the U-33 would cruise in these waters for a time, sinking neutral and enemy shipping indiscriminately, and looking for one of the German raiders that were supposed to be in these parts. He didn't shoot me the next morning as he had promised, and it has never been clear to me why he postponed the execution of my sentence. Instead, he kept me ironed just as he had been, then he kicked Bradley out of my room and took it all to himself. We cruised for a long time, sinking many vessels, all but one by gunfire, but we did not come across a German raider. I was surprised to note that von Schoenvorts often permitted Benson to take command, but I reconciled this by the fact that Benson appeared to know more of the duties of a submarine commander than did any of the stupid Germans. Once or twice Lys passed me, but for the most part she kept to her room. The first time she hesitated, as though she wished to speak to me, but I did not raise my head, and finally she passed on. Then one day came the word that we were about to round the horn, and that von Schoenvorts had taken it into his fool head to cruise up along the Pacific coast of North America and prey upon all sorts and conditions of merchantmen. I'll put the fear of God and the Kaiser into them, he said. The very first day we entered the South Pacific, we had an adventure. It turned out to be quite the most exciting adventure I had ever encountered. It fell about this way. About eight bells of the forenoon watch I heard a hail from the deck, and presently the footsteps of the entire ship's company from the amount of noise I heard at the ladder. Someone yelled back to those who had not yet reached the level of the deck, It's the raider, the German raider Geier. I saw that we had reached the end of our rope. Below all was quiet. Not a man remained. A door opened at the end of the narrow hull, and presently Nobbs came trotting up to me. He licked my face and rolled over on his back, reaching for me with his big, awkward paws. Then other footsteps sounded, approaching me. I knew whose they were, and I looked straight down at the flooring. The girl was coming almost at a run. She was at my side immediately. Here, she cried. Quick! And she slipped something into my hand. It was a key, the key to my irons. At my side, she also laid a pistol, and then she went on into the central. As she passed me, I saw that she carried another pistol for herself. It did not take me long to liberate myself, and then I was at her side. How can I thank you? I started, but she shut me up with a word. Do not thank me, she said coldly. I do not care to hear your thanks or any other expression from you. Do not stand there looking at me. I have given you a chance to do something. Now do it. The last was a peremptory command that made me jump. Glancing up, I saw that the tower was empty, and I lost no time in clambering up, looking about me. About a hundred yards off lay a small, swift cruiser raider, and above her floated the German man-of-war's flag. A boat had just been lowered, and I could see it moving toward us, filled with officers and men. The cruiser lay dead ahead. My, I thought, what a wonderful targ. I stopped even thinking, so surprised and shocked was I by the boldness of my imagery. The girl was just below me. I looked down on her wistfully. Could I trust her? Why had she released me at this moment? I must, I must. There was no other way. I dropped back below. Ask Olsen to step down here, please, I requested. And don't let anyone see you ask him. She looked at me with a puzzled expression on her face for the barest fraction of a second, and then she turned and went up the ladder. A moment later, Olsen returned, and the girl followed him. Quick, I whispered to the big Irishman and made for the bow compartment where the torpedo tubes are built into the boat. Here, too, were the torpedoes. The girl accompanied us, and when she saw the thing I had in mind, she stepped forward and lent a hand to the swinging of the great cylinder of death and destruction into the mouth of its tube. With oil and main strength, we shoved the torpedo home and shut the tube. Then I ran back to the conning tower, 
praying in my heart of hearts that the U-33 had not swung her boo away from the prey. No, thank God, never could aim have been truer. I signaled back to Olsen. Let her go. The U-33 trembled from stem to stern as the torpedo shot from its tube. I saw the white wake leap from her bow straight toward the enemy cruiser. A chorus of hoarse yells arose from the deck of our own craft. I saw the officers stand suddenly erect in the boat that was approaching us, and I heard loud cries and curses from the raider. Then I turned my attention to my own business. Most of the men on the submarine's deck were standing in paralyzed fascination, staring at the torpedo. Bradley happened to be looking toward the conning tower and saw me. I sprang on deck and ran toward him. Quick, I whispered. While they are stunned, we must overcome them. A German was standing near Bradley, just in front of him. The Englishman struck the fellow a frantic blow upon the neck and at the same time snatched his pistol from its holster. Von Schoenvorts had recovered from his first surprise quickly and had turned toward the main hatch to investigate. I covered him with my revolver, and at the same instant the torpedo struck the raider, the terrific explosion drowning the German's command to his men. Bradley was now running from one to another of our men, and though some of the Germans saw and heard him, they seemed too stunned for action. Olsen was below, so that there were only nine of us against eight Germans, for the man Bradley had struck still lay upon the deck. Only two of us were armed, but the hearts seemed to have gone out of the Bosch, and they put up but half-hearted resistance. Von Schoenvorts was the worst. He was fairly frenzied with rage and chagrin, and he came charging for me like a mad bull, and as he came, he discharged his pistol. If he'd stopped long enough to take aim, he might have gotten me, but his pace made him wild, so that not a shot touched me, and then we clinched and went to the deck. This left two pistols, which two of my own men were quick to appropriate. The Baron was no match for me in a hand-to-hand -hand encounter, and I soon had him pinned to the deck, and the life almost choked out of him. A half hour later, things had quieted down, and all was much the same as before the prisoners had revolted, only we kept a much closer watch on von Schoenvorts. The Geier had sunk while we were still battling upon our deck, and afterward we had drawn away toward the north, leaving the survivors to the attention of the single boat which had been making its way toward us when Olsen launched the torpedo. I suppose the poor devils never reached land, and if they did, they most probably perished on that cold and unhospitable shore. But I couldn't permit them aboard the U-33. We had all the Germans we could take care of. That evening, the girl asked permission to go on deck. She said that she felt the effects of long confinement below, and I readily granted her request. I could not understand her and I craved an opportunity to talk with her again in an effort to fathom her and her intentions, and so I made it a point to follow her up the ladder. It was a clear, cold, beautiful night. The sea was calm except for the white water at our bows and the two long radiating swells running far off into the distance upon either hand astern, forming a great V which our propellers filled with choppy waves. Benson was in the tower, we were bound for San Diego, and all looked well. Liz stood with a heavy blanket wrapped around her slender figure, and as I approached her, she half turned toward me to see who it was. When she recognized me, she immediately turned away. I want to thank you, I said, for your bravery and loyalty. You were magnificent. I am sorry that you had reason before to think that I doubted you. You did doubt me, she replied in a level voice. You practically accused me of aiding Baron von Schoenvorts. I can never forgive you. There was a great deal of finality in both her words and tone. I could not believe it, I said. And yet two of my men reported having seen you in conversation with von Schoenvorts late at night upon two separate occasions, after each of which some great damage was found done us in the morning. I didn't want to doubt you but I carried all the responsibility of the lives of these men, of the safety of the ship, of your life and mine. I had to watch you, and I had to put you on your guard against a repetition of your madness. She was looking at me now with those great eyes of hers, very wide and round. 
Who told you that I spoke with Baron von Schoenvorts at night, or any other time? she asked. I cannot tell you, Liz, I replied, but it came to me from two different sources. Then two men have lied, she asserted, without heat. I have not spoken to Baron von Schoenvorts other than in your presence when first we came aboard the U-33. And please, when you address me, remember that to others than my intimates, I am Miss LaRue. Did you ever get slapped in the face when you least expected it? No. Well, then you do not know how I felt at that moment. I could feel the hot, red flush surging up my neck, across my cheeks, over my ears, clear to my scalp. And it made me love her all the more. It made me swear inwardly a thousand solemn oaths that I would win her. Chapter 4 For several days, things went along in about the same course. I took our position every morning with my crude sextant, but the results were always most unsatisfactory. They always showed a considerable westing when I knew that we had been sailing due north. I blamed my crude instrument and kept on. Then, one afternoon, the girl came to me. Pardon me, she said, but were I you, I should watch this man Benson, especially when he is in charge. I asked her what she meant, thinking I could see the influence of von Schoenvorts raising a suspicion against one of my most trusted men. If you will note the boat's course a half hour after Benson goes on duty, she said, you will know what I mean, and you will understand why he prefers a night watch. Possibly, too, you will understand some other things that have taken place aboard. Then she went back to her room, thus ending the conversation. I waited until half an hour after Benson had gone on duty, and then I went on deck, passing through the conning tower where Benson sat and looking at the compass. It showed that our course was north by west, that is, one point west of north, which was for our assumed position about right. I was greatly relieved to find that nothing was wrong, for the girl's words had caused me considerable apprehension. I was about to return to my room when a thought occurred to me that again caused me to change my mind, and, incidentally, came near proving my death warrant. When I had left the conning tower little more than a half hour since, the sea had been breaking over the port bow, and it seemed to me quite improbable that in so short a time an equally heavy sea could be deluging us from the opposite side of the ship. Winds may change quickly, but not a long, heavy sea. There was only one other solution. Since I left the tower, our course had been altered some eight points. Turning quickly, I climbed out upon the conning tower, a single glance at the heavens confirmed my suspicions. The constellations, which should have been dead ahead, were directly starboard. We were sailing due west. Just for an instant longer, I stood there to check up my calculations. I wanted to be quite sure before I accused Benson of perfidy, and about the only thing I came near making quite sure of was death. I cannot see even now how I escaped it. I was standing on the edge of the conning tower, when a heavy palm suddenly struck me between the shoulders and hurled me forward into space. The drop to the triangular deck forward of the conning tower might easily have broken a leg for me, or I might have slipped off onto the deck and rolled overboard. But fate was upon my side, as I was only slightly bruised. As I came to my feet, I heard the conning tower cover slam. There is a ladder which leads from the deck to the top of the tower. Up this, I scrambled, as fast as I could go, but Benson had the cover tight before I reached it. I stood there a moment in dumb consternation. What did the fellow intend? What was going on below? If Benson was a traitor, how could I know that there were not other traitors among us? I cursed myself for my folly in going out upon the deck, and then this thought suggested another, a hideous one. Who was it that had really been responsible for my being here? Thinking to attract attention from inside the craft, I again ran down the ladder and onto the small deck, only to find that the steel covers of the conning tower windows were shut, and then I leaned with my back against the tower and cursed myself for a gullible idiot. I glanced at the bow. The sea seemed to be getting heavier, for every wave now washed completely over the lower deck. I watched them for a moment, and then a sudden chill pervaded my entire being. 
It was not the chill of wet clothing or the dashing spray which drenched my face. No, it was the chill of the hand of death upon my heart. In an instant, I had turned the last corner of life's highway and was looking God Almighty in the face. The U-33 was being slowly submerged. It would be difficult, even impossible, to set down in writing my sensations at that moment. All I can particularly recall is that I laughed, though neither from a spirit of bravado nor from hysteria, and I wanted to smoke. Lord, how I did want to smoke, but that was out of the question. I watched the water rise until the little deck I stood on was awash, and then I clambered once more to the top of the conning tower. From the very slow submergence of the boat, I knew that Benson was doing the entire trick alone, that he was merely permitting the diving tanks to fill, and that the diving rudders were not in use. The throbbing of the engine ceased, and in its stead came the steady vibration of the electric motors. The water was halfway up the conning tower. I had perhaps five minutes longer on the deck. I tried to decide what I should do after I was washed away. Should I swim until exhaustion claimed me, or should I give up and end the agony at the first plunge? From below came two muffled reports. They sounded not unlike shots. Was Benson meeting with resistance? Personally, it could mean little to me, for even though my men might overcome the enemy, none would know of my predicament until long after it was too late to succor me. The top of the conning tower was now awash. I clung to the wireless mast, while the great waves surged sometimes completely over me. I knew the end was near, and almost involuntarily, I did that which I had not done since childhood. I prayed. After that, I felt better. I clung and waited, but the water rose no higher. Instead, it receded. Now, the top of the conning tower received only the crests of the higher waves. Now, the little triangular deck below became visible. What had occurred within? Did Benson believe me already gone, and was he emerging because of that belief, or had he and his forces been vanquished? The suspense was more wearing than that which I had endured while waiting for dissolution. Presently the main deck came into view, and then the conning tower opened behind me, and I turned to look into the anxious face of Bradley. An expression of relief overspread his features. Thank God, man! was all he said as he reached forth and dragged me into the tower. I was cold and numb, and rather all in. Another few minutes would have done for me, I am sure, but the warmth of the interior helped to revive me, aided and abetted by some brandy which Bradley poured down my throat, from which it nearly removed the membrane. That brandy would have revived a corpse. When I got down into the centrale, I saw the Germans lined up on one side with a couple of my men with pistols standing over them. Von Schoenvorts was among them. On the floor lay Benson, moaning, and beyond him stood the girl, a revolver in one hand. I looked about, bewildered. What has happened down here? I asked. Tell me, Bradley replied. You see the result, sir, he said. It might have been a very different result, but for Miss LaRue, we were all asleep. Benson had relieved the guard early in the evening. There was no one to watch him, no one but Miss LaRue. She felt the submergence of the boat and came out of her room to investigate. She was just in time to see Benson at the diving rudders. When he saw her, he raised his pistol and fired point-blank at her, but he missed, and she fired, and didn't miss. The two shots awakened everyone, and as our men were armed, the result was inevitable as you see it. But it would have been very different had it not been for Miss LaRue. It was she who closed the diving tank seacocks and roused Olsen and me, and had the pumps started to empty them. And there I had been thinking that through her machinations I had been lured to the deck and to my death. I could have gone on my knees to her and begged her forgiveness, or at least I could have had I not been Anglo-Saxon. As it was, I could only remove my soggy cap and bow and mumble my appreciation. She made no reply, only turned and walked very rapidly toward her room. Could I have heard a right? Was it really a sob that came floating back to me through the narrow aisle of the U-33? Benson died that night. He remained defiant almost to the last, but just before he went out, 
He motioned to me, and I leaned over to catch the faintly whispered words. I did it alone, he said. I did it because I hate you. I hate all your kind. I was kicked out of your shipyard at Santa Monica. I was locked out of California. I'm an IWWI, became a German agent, not because I love them, for I hate them too, but because I wanted to injure Americans, whom I hated more. I threw the wireless apparatus overboard. I destroyed the chronometer and the sextant. I devised a scheme for varying the compass to suit my wishes. I told Wilson that I had seen the girl talking with von Schoenvorts, and I made the poor egg think he had seen her doing the same thing. I am sorry. Sorry that my plans failed. I hate you. He didn't die for a half hour after that, nor did he speak again, aloud. But just a few seconds before he went to meet his maker, his lips moved in a faint whisper. And as I leaned closer to catch his words, what do you suppose I heard? Now I lay me down to sleep. That was all. Benson was dead. We threw his body overboard. The wind of that night brought on some pretty rough weather with a lot of black clouds which persisted for several days. We didn't know what course we'd been holding, and there was no way of finding out, as we could no longer trust the compass, not knowing what Benson had done to it. The long and the short of it was that we cruised about aimlessly until the sun came out again. I'll never forget that day or its surprises. We reckoned, or rather guessed, that we were somewhere off the coast of Peru. The wind, which had been blowing fitfully from the east, suddenly veered around into the south, and presently we felt a sudden chill. Peru! snorted Olsen. When were years after smelling icebergs off Peru? Icebergs? Icebergs nothing! exclaimed one of the Englishmen. Why, man, they don't come north of fourteen here in these waters. Then, replied Olsen, you're south of fourteen, me boy. We thought he was crazy, but he wasn't, for that afternoon we sighted a great berg south of us, and we'd been running north, we thought, for days. I can tell you we were a discouraged lot, but we got a faint thrill of hope early the next morning when the lookout bawled down the open hatch. Land! Land! Northwest by west! I think we were all sick for the sight of land. I know that I was, but my interest was quickly dissipated by the sudden illness of three of the Germans. Almost simultaneously, they commenced vomiting. They couldn't suggest any explanation for it. I asked them what they had eaten, and found they had eaten nothing other than the food cooked for all of us. Have you drunk anything? I asked, for I knew that there was liquor aboard and medicines in the same locker. Only water, moaned one of them. We all drank water together this morning. We opened a new tank. Maybe it was the water. I started an investigation which revealed a terrifying condition. Someone, probably Benson, had poisoned all the running water on the ship. It would have been worse, though, had land not been in sight. The sight of land filled us with renewed hope. Our course had been altered, and we were rapidly approaching what appeared to be a precipitous headland. Cliffs, seemingly rising perpendicularly out of the sea, faded away into the mist upon either hand as we approached. The land before us might have been a continent, so mighty appeared the shoreline, yet we knew that we must be thousands of miles from the nearest western landmass, New Zealand or Australia. We took our bearings with our crude and inaccurate instruments, we searched the chart, we cudgelled our brains, and at last it was Bradley who suggested a solution. He was in the tower, and watching the compass, to which he called my attention. The needle was pointing straight toward the land. Bradley swung the helm hard to starboard. I could feel the U-33 respond, and yet the arrow still clung straight and sure toward the distant cliffs. What do you make of it? I asked him. Did you ever hear of Caproni? he asked. An early Italian navigator? I returned. Yes, he followed Cook about 1721. He is scarcely mentioned even by contemporaneous historians, probably because he got into political difficulties on his return to Italy. It was the fashion to scoff at his claims, but I recall reading one of his works, his only one, I believe, in which he described a new continent in the South Seas, a continent made up of some strange metal which attracted the compass, 
a rock-bound, inhospitable coast without beach or harbour, which extended for hundreds of miles. He could make no landing, nor in the several days he cruised about it did he see sign of life. He called it Caprona and sailed away. I believe, sir, that we are looking upon the coast of Caprona, uncharted and forgotten for two hundred years. If you are right, it might account for much of the deviation of the compass during the past two days, I suggested. Caprona has been luring us upon her deadly rocks. Well, we'll accept her challenge. We'll land upon Caprona. Along that long front, there must be a vulnerable spot. We will find it, Bradley, for we must find it. We must find water on Caprona, or we must die. And so we approached the coast, upon which no living eyes had ever rested. Straight from the ocean's depths rose towering cliffs, shot with brown and blues and greens, withered moss and lichen, and the verdigris of copper, and everywhere the rusty ochre of iron pyrites. The cliff tops, though ragged, were of such uniform height as to suggest the boundaries of a great plateau, and now and again we caught glimpses of verdure topping the rocky escarpment, as though bush or jungle land had pushed outward from a lush vegetation farther inland to signal to an unseeing world that Caprona lived and joyed in life beyond her austere and repellent coast. But metaphor, however poetic, never slaked a dry throat. To enjoy Caprona's romantic suggestions, we must have water. And so we came in close, always sounding, and skirted the shore. As close in as we dared cruise, we found fathomless depths, and always the same undented coastline of bald cliffs. As darkness threatened, we drew away and lay well off the coast all night. We had not as yet really commenced to suffer for lack of water, but I knew that it would not be long before we did, and so, at the first streak of dawn, I moved in again and once more took up the hopeless survey of the forbidding coast. Toward noon, we discovered a beach, the first we had seen. It was a narrow strip of sand at the base of a part of the cliff that seemed lower than any we had before scanned. At its foot, half buried in the sand, lay great boulders, mute evidence that in a bygone age, some mighty natural force had crumpled Caprona's barrier at this point. It was Bradley who first called our attention to a strange object lying among the boulders above the surf. Looks like a man, he said, and passed his glasses to me. I looked long and carefully, and could have sworn that the thing I saw was the sprawled figure of a human being. Miss LaRue was on deck with us. I turned and asked her to go below. Without a word, she did as I bade. Then I stripped, and as I did so, Nobbs looked questioningly at me. He had been wont at home to enter the surf with me, and evidently he had not forgotten it. "'What are you going to do, sir?' asked Olsen. "'I'm going to see what that thing is on shore,' I replied. "'If it's a man, it may mean that Caprona is inhabited, or it may merely mean that some poor devils were shipwrecked here. I ought to be able to tell from the clothing which is more near the truth.' "'How about sharks?' queried Olsen. Sure, you ought to carry a knife. Here you are, sir, cried one of the men. It was a long, slim blade he offered, one that I could carry between my teeth, and so I accepted it gladly. Keep close in, I directed Bradley, and then I dived over the side and struck out for the narrow beach. There was another splash directly behind me, and turning my head, I saw faithful old knobs swimming valiantly in my wake. The surf was not heavy, and there was no undertow, so we made shore easily, effecting an equally easy landing. The beach was composed largely of small stones worn smooth by the action of water. There was little sand, though from the deck of the U-33 the beach had appeared to be all sand, and I saw no evidences of mollusca or crustacea, such as are common to all beaches I have previously seen. I attribute this to the fact of the smallness of the beach, the enormous depth of surrounding water, and the great distance at which Caprona lies from her nearest neighbour. As Nobbs and I approached the recumbent figure farther up the beach, I was appraised by my nose that whether man or not, the thing had once been organic and alive, but that for some time it had been dead. Nobbs halted, sniffed, and growled. 
A little later he sat down upon his haunches, raised his muzzle to the heavens, and bade forth a most dismal howl. I shied a small stone at him and bade him shut up. His uncanny noise made me nervous. When I had come quite close to the thing, I still could not say whether it had been man or beast. The carcass was badly swollen and partly decomposed. There was no sign of clothing upon or about it. A fine brownish hair covered the chest and abdomen, and the face, the palms of the hands, the feet, the shoulders and back were practically hairless. The creature must have been about the height of a fair-sized man. Its features were similar to those of a man, yet had it been a man? I could not say, for it resembled an ape no more than it did a man. Its large toes protruded laterally, as do those of the semi-arboreal peoples of Borneo, the Philippines, and other remote regions where low types still persist. The countenance might have been that of a cross between Pythocanthropus, the Java ape-man, and a daughter of the Piltdown race of prehistoric Sussex. A wooden cudgel lay beside the corpse. Now this fact set me thinking. There was no wood of any description in sight. There was nothing about the beach to suggest a wrecked mariner. There was absolutely nothing about the body to suggest that it might possibly in life have known a maritime experience. It was the body of a low type of man, or a high type of beast. In neither instance would it have been of a seafaring race. Therefore I deduced that it was native to Caprona, that it lived inland, and that it had fallen or been hurled from the cliffs above. Such being the case, Caprona was inhabitable, if not inhabited, by man. But how to reach the inhabitable interior? That was the question. A closer view of the cliffs than had been afforded me from the deck of the U-33 only confirmed my conviction that no mortal man could scale those perpendicular heights. There was not a finger hold, not a toe hold upon them. I turned away, baffled. Nobbs and I met with no sharks upon our return journey to the submarine. My report filled everyone with theories and speculations, and with renewed hope and determination. They all reasoned along the same lines that I had reasoned. The conclusions were obvious, but not the water. We were now thirstier than ever. The balance of that day we spent in continuing a minute and fruitless exploration of the monotonous coast. There was not another break in the frowning cliffs, not even another minute patch of pebbly beach. As the sun fell, so did our spirits. I had tried to make advances to the girl again, but she would have none of me, and so I was not only thirsty, but otherwise sad and downhearted. I was glad when the new day broke the hideous spell of a sleepless night. The morning search brought us no shred of hope. Caprona was impregnable, that was the decision of all. Yet we kept on. It must have been about two bells of the afternoon watch that Bradley called my attention to the branch of a tree with leaves upon it, floating on the sea. It may have been carried down to the ocean by a river, he suggested. Yes, I replied. It may have. It may have tumbled or been thrown off the top of one of these cliffs. Bradley's face fell. I thought of that too, he replied, but I wanted to believe the other. Right you are, I cried. We must believe the other until we prove it false. We can't afford to give up heart now when we need heart most. The branch was carried down by a river, and we're going to find that river. I smote my open palm with a clenched fist to emphasize a determination unsupported by hope. There, I cried suddenly. See that, Bradley? And I pointed at a spot closer to shore. See that, man? Some flowers and grasses and another leafy branch floated toward us. We both scanned the water and the coastline. Bradley evidently discovered something, or at least thought that he had. He called down for a bucket and a rope, and when they were passed up to him, he lowered the former into the sea and drew it in, filled with water. Of this, he took a taste, and straightening up, looked into my eyes with an expression of elation, as much as to say, I told you so. This water is warm, he announced, and fresh. I grabbed the bucket and tasted its contents. The water was very warm, and it was fresh, but there was a most unpleasant taste to it. Did you ever taste water from a stagnant pool full of tadpoles? Bradley asked. That's it, I exclaimed. 
That's just the taste exactly, though I haven't experienced it since boyhood. But how can water from a flowing stream taste thus, and what the dickens makes it so warm? It must be at least 70 or 80 Fahrenheit, possibly higher. Yes, agreed Bradley. I should say higher, but where does it come from? That is easily discovered now that we have found it, I answered. It can't come from the ocean, so it must come from the land. All that we have to do is follow it, and sooner or later we shall come upon its source. We were already rather close in, but I ordered the U-33's prow turned in shore, and we crept slowly along, constantly dipping up the water and tasting it to assure ourselves that we didn't get outside the fresh water current. There was a very light offshore wind and scarcely any breakers, so that the approach to the shore was continued without finding bottom. Yet though we were already quite close, we saw no indication of any indention in the coast from which even a tiny brooklet might issue, and certainly no mouth of a large river such as this must necessarily be to freshen the ocean even two hundred yards from shore. The tide was running out, and this, together with the strong flow of the freshwater current, would have prevented our going against the cliffs, even had we not been under power. As it was, we had to buck the combined forces in order to hold our position at all. We came up to within twenty-five feet of the sheer wall, which loomed high above us. There was no break in its forbidding face. As we watched the face of the waters and searched the cliff's high face, Olsen suggested that the fresh water might come from a submarine geyser. This, he said, would account for its heat. But even as he spoke a bush, covered thickly with leaves and flowers, bubbled to the surface and floated off astern. Flowering shrubs don't thrive in the subterranean caverns from which geysers spring, suggested Bradley. Olsen shook his head. It beats me, he said. I've got it, I exclaimed suddenly. Look there! And I pointed at the base of the cliff ahead of us, which the receding tide was gradually exposing to our view. They all looked and all saw what I had seen, the top of a dark opening in the rock through which water was pouring out into the sea. It's the subterranean channel of an inland river, I cried. It flows through a land covered with vegetation, and therefore a land upon which the sun shines. No subterranean caverns produce any order of plant life even remotely resembling what we have seen disgorged by this river. Beyond those cliffs lie fertile lands and fresh water, perhaps game. Yes, sir, said Olsen. Behind the cliffs. You spoke a true word, sir. Behind. Bradley laughed, a rather sorry laugh, though. You might as well call our attention to the fact, sir, he said, that science has indicated that there is fresh water and vegetation on Mars. Not at all, I rejoined. A U-boat isn't constructed to navigate space, but it is designed to travel below the surface of the water. You'd be after sailing into that blank pocket, asked Olsen. I would, Olsen, I replied. We haven't one chance for life in a hundred thousand if we don't find food and water upon Caprona. This water coming out of the cliff is not salt, but neither is it fit to drink, though each of us has drunk. It is fair to assume that inland the river is fed by pure streams, that there are fruits and herbs and game. Shall we lie out here and die of thirst and starvation with a land of plenty possibly only a few hundred yards away? We have the means for navigating a subterranean river. Are we too cowardly to utilize this means? Be after going to it, said Olsen. I am willing to see it through, agreed Bradley. Then under the bottom, with the best of luck, and give them hell, cried a young fellow who had been in the trenches. To the diving stations, I commanded, and in less than a minute, the deck was deserted. The conning tower covers had slammed to, and the U-33 was submerging, possibly for the last time. I know that I had this feeling, and I think that most of the others did. As we went down, I sat in the tower with the searchlight projecting its seemingly feeble rays ahead. We submerged very slowly, and without headway more than sufficient to keep her nose in the right direction, and as we went down, I saw outlined ahead of us the black opening in the great cliff. It was an opening that would have admitted a half-dozen U-boats at one and the same time, roughly cylindrical in contour, 
and dark as the pit of perdition. As I gave the command which sent the U-33 slowly ahead, I could not but feel a certain uncanny presentiment of evil. Where were we going? What lay at the end of this great sewer? Had we bidden farewell forever to the sunlight and life, or were there before us dangers even greater than those which we now faced? I tried to keep my mind from vain imagining by calling everything which I observed to the eager ears below. I was the eyes of the whole company, and I did my best not to fail them. We had advanced a hundred yards, perhaps, when our first danger confronted us. Just ahead was a sharp right-angled turn in the tunnel. I could see the river's flotsam hurtling against the rocky wall upon the left as it was driven on by the mighty current, and I feared for the safety of the U-33 in making so sharp a turn under such adverse conditions. But there was nothing for it but to try. I didn't warn my fellows of the danger. It could have but caused them useless apprehension, for if we were to be smashed against the rocky wall, no power on earth could avert the quick end that would come to us. I gave the command full speed ahead and went charging toward the menace. I was forced to approach the dangerous left-hand wall in order to make the turn, and I depended upon the power of the motors to carry us through the surging waters in safety. Well, we made it, but it was a narrow squeak. As we swung around, the full force of the current caught us and drove the stern against the rocks. There was a thud which sent a tremor through the whole craft, and then a moment of nasty grinding as the steel hull scraped the rock wall. I expected momentarily the inrush of waters that would seal our doom, but presently from below came the welcome word that all was well. In another fifty yards there was a second turn, this time toward the left, but it was more of a gentle curve, and we took it without trouble. After that it was plain sailing, though as far as I could know there might be most anything ahead of us, and my nerves strained to the snapping point every instant. After the second turn, the channel ran comparatively straight for between 150 and 200 yards. The waters grew suddenly lighter, and my spirits rose accordingly. I shouted down to those below that I saw daylight ahead, and a great shout of thanksgiving reverberated through the ship. A moment later, we emerged into sunlit water, and immediately I raised the periscope and looked about me upon the strangest landscape I had ever seen. We were in the middle of a broad and now sluggish river, the banks of which were lined by giant arboraceous ferns, raising their mighty fronds fifty, one hundred, two hundred feet into the quiet air. Close by us, something rose to the surface of the river and dashed at the periscope. I had a vision of wide, distended jaws, and then all was blotted out. A shiver ran down into the tower as the thing closed upon the periscope. A moment later it was gone, and I could see again. Above the trees there soared into my vision a huge thing on bat-like wings, a creature large as a large whale, but fashioned more after the order of a lizard. Then again, something charged the periscope and blotted out the mirror. I will confess that I was almost gasping for breath as I gave the commands to emerge. Into what sort of strange land had fate guided us? The instant the deck was awash, I opened the conning tower hatch and stepped out. In another minute, the deck hatch lifted, and those who were not on duty below streamed up the ladder, Olsen bringing knobs under one arm. For several minutes, no one spoke. I think they must each have been as overcome by awe as was I. All about us was a flora and fauna as strange and wonderful to us as might have been those upon a distant planet had we suddenly been miraculously transported through ether to an unknown world. Even the grass upon the nearer bank was unearthly. Lush and high it grew, and each blade bore upon its tip a brilliant flower, violet or yellow or carmine or blue, making as gorgeous a sward as human imagination might conceive. But the life, it teemed. The tall, fern-like trees were alive with monkeys, snakes and lizards. Huge insects hummed and buzzed hither and thither. 
Mighty forms could be seen moving upon the ground in the thick forest, while the bosom of the river wriggled with living things, and above flapped the wings of gigantic creatures such as we are taught have been extinct throughout countless ages. Look, cried Olsen, would you look at the giraffe coming up out of the bottom of the say? We looked in the direction he pointed, and saw a long, glossy neck surmounted by a small head rising above the surface of the river. Presently, the back of the creature was exposed, brown and glossy as the water dripped from it. It turned its eyes upon us, opened its lizard-like mouth, emitted a shrill hiss, and came for us. The thing must have been sixteen or eighteen feet in length, and closely resembled pictures I had seen of restored plesiosaurs of the lower Jurassic. It charged us as savagely as a mad bull, and one would have thought it intended to destroy and devour the mighty U-boat, as I verily believe it did intend. We were moving slowly up the river as the creature bore down upon us with distended jaws. The long neck was far outstretched, and the four flippers with which it swam were working with powerful strokes, carrying it forward at a rapid pace. When it reached the craft's side, the jaws closed upon one of the stanchions of the deck rail and tore it from its socket as though it had been a toothpick stuck in putty. At this exhibition of titanic strength, I think we all simultaneously stepped backward, and Bradley drew his revolver and fired. The bullet struck the thing in the neck, just above its body, but instead of disabling it, merely increased its rage. Its hissing rose to a shrill scream as it raised half its body out of water onto the sloping sides of the hull of the U-33 and endeavoured to scramble upon the deck to devour us. A dozen shots rang out as we who were armed drew our pistols and fired at the thing, but though struck several times it showed no signs of succumbing and only floundered farther aboard the submarine. I had noticed that the girl had come on deck and was standing not far behind me, and when I saw the danger to which we were all exposed, I turned and forced her toward the hatch. We had not spoken for some days, and we did not speak now, but she gave me a disdainful look, which was quite as eloquent as words, and broke loose from my grasp. I saw I could do nothing with her unless I exerted force, and so I turned with my back toward her that I might be in a position to shield her from the strange reptile should it really succeed in reaching the deck. And as I did so, I saw the thing raise one flipper over the rail, dart its head forward, and with the quickness of lightning seize upon one of the Bosch. I ran forward, discharging my pistol into the creature's body in an effort to force it to relinquish its prey, but I might as profitably have shot at the sun. Shrieking and screaming, the German was dragged from the deck, and the moment the reptile was clear of the boat, it dived beneath the surface of the water with its terrified prey. I think we were all more or less shaken by the frightfulness of the tragedy, until Olsen remarked that the balance of power now rested where it belonged. Following the death of Benson, we had been nine and nine, nine Germans and nine allies, as we called ourselves. Now there were but eight Germans. We never counted the girl on either side, I suppose, because she was a girl, though we knew well enough now that she was ours. And so Olsen's remark helped to clear the atmosphere for the Allies, at least, and then our attention was once more directed toward the river, for around us there had sprung up a perfect bedlam of screams and hisses and a seething cauldron of hideous reptiles, devoid of fear and filled only with hunger and with rage. They clambered, squirmed, and wriggled to the deck, forcing us steadily backward, though we emptied our pistols into them. There were all sorts and conditions of horrible things, huge, hideous, grotesque, monstrous, a veritable Mesozoic nightmare. I saw that the girl was gotten below as quickly as possible, and she took Nobbs with her. Poor Nobbs had nearly barked his head off, and I think, too, that for the first time since his littlest puppyhood, he had known fear nor can I blame him. After the girl I sent Bradley and most of the Allies, and then the Germans who were on deck, von Schoenvorts being still in irons below, the creatures were approaching perilously close before I dropped through the hatchway and slammed down the cover. Then I went into the tower and ordered full speed ahead, hoping to distance the fearsome things, but it was useless. 
Not only could any of them easily outdistance the U-33, but the further upstream we progressed, the greater the number of our besiegers, until fearful of navigating a strange river at high speed, I gave orders to reduce and moved slowly and majestically through the plunging, hissing mass. I was mighty glad that our entrance into the interior of Caprona had been inside a submarine rather than in any other form of vessel. I could readily understand how it might have been that Caprona had been invaded in the past by venturesome navigators without word of it ever reaching the outside world, for I can assure you that only by submarine could man pass up that great sluggish river alive. We proceeded up the river for some forty miles before darkness overtook us. I was afraid to submerge and lie on the bottom overnight, for fear that the mud might be deep enough to hold us, and as we could not hold with the anchor, I ran in close to shore, and in a brief interim of attack from the reptiles, we made fast to a large tree. We also dipped up some of the river water and found it, though quite warm, a little sweeter than before. We had food enough, and with the water we were all quite refreshed, but we missed fresh meat. It had been weeks now since we had tasted it, and the sight of the reptiles gave me an idea that a steak or two from one of them might not be bad eating. So I went on deck with a rifle, twenty of which were aboard the U-33. At sight of me, a huge thing charged and climbed to the deck. I retreated to the top of the conning tower, and when it had raised its mighty bulk to the level of the little deck on which I stood, I let it have a bullet right between the eyes. The thing stopped then, and looked at me a moment as much as to say, Why this thing has a stinger? I must be careful. And then it reached out its long neck and opened its mighty jaws and grabbed for me. But I wasn't there. I had tumbled backward into the tower, and I mighty near killed myself doing it. When I glanced up, that little head on the end of its long neck was coming straight down on top of me, and once more I tumbled into greater safety, sprawling upon the floor of the central. Olsen was looking up, and seeing what was poking about in the tower, ran for an axe. Nor did he hesitate a moment when he returned with one, but sprang up the ladder and commenced chopping away at that hideous face. The thing didn't have sufficient brain pan to entertain more than a single idea at once. Though chopped and hacked, and with a bullet hole between its eyes, it still persisted madly in its attempt to get inside the tower and devour Olsen, though its body was many times the diameter of the hatch. Nor did it cease its efforts until after Olsen had succeeded in decapitating it. Then the two men went on deck through the main hatch, and while one kept watch, the other cut a hind quarter off Plesiosaurus Olsoni, as Bradley dubbed the thing. Meantime, Olsen cut off the long neck, saying that it would make fine soup. By the time we had cleared away the blood and refuse in the tower, the cook had juicy steaks and a steaming broth upon the electric stove, and the aroma arising from P. Olsoni filled us all with a hitherto unfelt admiration for him and all his kind. Chapter 5 The steaks we had that night, and they were fine and the following morning we tasted the broth. It seemed odd to be eating a creature that should, by all the laws of paleontology, have been extinct for several million years. It gave one a feeling of newness that was almost embarrassing, although it didn't seem to embarrass our appetites. Olsen ate until I thought he would burst. The girl ate with us that night at the little officer's mess just back of the torpedo compartment. The narrow table was unfolded, the four stools were set out, and for the first time in days we sat down to eat, and for the first time in weeks we had something to eat other than the monotony of the short rations of an impoverished U-boat. Nobs sat between the girl and me and was fed with morsels of the plesiosaurus steak at the risk of forever contaminating his manners. He looked at me sheepishly all the time, for he knew that no well-bred dog should eat at table but the poor fellow was so wasted from improper food that I couldn't enjoy my own meal had he been denied an immediate share in it. And anyway, Lys wanted to feed him, so there you are. Lys was coldly polite to me and sweetly gracious to Bradley and Olsen. She wasn't of the gushing type I knew, 
so I didn't expect much from her and was duly grateful for the few morsels of attention she threw upon the floor to me. We had a pleasant meal, with only one unfortunate occurrence, when Olsen suggested that possibly the creature we were eating was the same one that ate the German. It was some time before we could persuade the girl to continue her meal, but at last Bradley prevailed upon her, pointing out that we had come upstream nearly 40 miles since the Bosch had been seized, and that during that time we had seen literally thousands of these denizens of the river, indicating that the chances were very remote that this was the same plesiosaur. And anyway, he concluded, it was only a scheme of Mr. Olson's to get all the stakes for himself. We discussed the future and ventured opinions as to what lay before us, but we could only theorize at best, for none of us knew. If the whole land was infested by these and similar horrid monsters, life would be impossible upon it, and we decided that we would only search long enough to find and take aboard fresh water and such meat and fruits as might be safely procurable, and then retrace our way beneath the cliffs to the open sea. And so, at last, we turned into our narrow bunks, hopeful, happy, and at peace with ourselves, our lives, and our God, to awaken the following morning refreshed and still optimistic. We had an easy time getting away, as we learned later, because the Saurians do not commence to feed until late in the morning. From noon to midnight, their curve of activity is at its height, while from dawn to about nine o'clock, it is lowest. As a matter of fact, we didn't see one of them all the time we were getting underway, though I had the cannon raised to the deck and manned against an assault. I hoped, but I was none too sure, that shells might discourage them. The trees were full of monkeys of all sizes and shades, and once we thought we saw a man-like creature watching us from the depth of the forest. Shortly after we resumed our course upstream, we saw the mouth of another and smaller river emptying into the main channel from the south, that is, upon our right, and almost immediately after we came upon a large island five or six miles in length, and at fifty miles there was a still larger river than the last coming in from the northwest, the course of the main stream having now changed to northeast by southwest. The water was quite free from reptiles, and the vegetation upon the banks of the river had altered to more open and park-like forest, with eucalyptus and acacia mingled with a scattering of tree ferns as though two distinct periods of geologic time had overlapped and merged. The grass, too, was less flowering, though there were still gorgeous patches mottling the greensward, and lastly, the fauna was less multitudinous. Six or seven miles farther, and the river widened considerably. Before us opened an expanse of water to the farther horizon, and then we sailed out upon an inland sea so large that only a shoreline upon our side was visible to us. The waters all about us were alive with life. There were still a few reptiles, but there were fish by the thousands, by the millions. The water of the inland sea was very warm, almost hot, and the atmosphere was hot and heavy above it. It seemed strange that beyond the buttressed walls of Caprona icebergs floated and the south wind was biting, for only a gentle breeze moved across the face of these living waters, and that was damp and warm. Gradually, we commenced to divest ourselves of our clothing, retaining only sufficient for modesty, but the sun was not hot. It was more the heat of a steam room than of an oven. We coasted up the shore of the lake in a northwesterly direction, sounding all the time. We found the lake deep and the bottom rocky and steeply shelving toward the center, and once when I moved straight out from shore to take other soundings we could find no bottom whatsoever. In open spaces along the shore we caught occasional glimpses of the distant cliffs, and here they appeared only a trifle less precipitous than those which bound Caprona on the seaward side. My theory is that in a far distant era, Caprona was a mighty mountain, perhaps the world's mightiest mountain, and that in some titanic eruption, volcanic action blew off the entire crest, blew thousands of feet of the mountain upward and outward and onto the surrounding continent, leaving a great crater. And then, possibly, the continent sank as ancient continents have been known to do, 
leaving only the summit of Caprona above the sea, the encircling walls, the central lake, the hot springs which feed the lake, all point to such a conclusion, and the fauna and the flora bear indisputable evidence that Caprona was once part of some great landmass. As we cruised up along the coast, the landscape continued a more or less open forest, with here and there a small plain where we saw animals grazing. With my glass, I could make out a species of large red deer, some antelope, and what appeared to be a species of horse, and once I saw the shaggy form of what might have been a monstrous bison. Here was game, a plenty. There seemed little danger of starving upon Caprona. The game, however, seemed wary. For the instant the animals discovered us, they threw up their heads and tails and went cavorting off, those farther inland following the example of the others, until all were lost in the mazes of the distant forest. Only the great shaggy ox stood his ground. With lowered head, he watched us until we had passed, and then continued feeding. About twenty miles up the coast from the mouth of the river, we encountered low cliffs of sandstone, broken and tortured evidence of the great upheaval which had torn Caprona asunder in the past, intermingling upon a common level the rock formations of widely separated eras, fusing some and leaving others untouched. We ran along beside them for a matter of ten miles, arriving off a broad cleft which led into what appeared to be another lake. As we were in search of pure water, we did not wish to overlook any portion of the coast, and so after sounding and finding that we had ample depth, I ran the U-33 between headlands into as pretty a landlocked harbour as sailormen could care to see, with good water right up to within a few yards of the shore. As we cruised slowly along, two of the Boches again saw what they believed to be a man or man-like creature, watching us from a fringe of trees a hundred yards inland and shortly after we discovered the mouth of a small stream emptying into the bay. It was the first stream we had found since leaving the river, and I at once made preparations to test its water. To land, it would be necessary to run the U-33 close into the shore, at least as close as we could, for even these waters were infested, though not so thickly, by savage reptiles. I ordered sufficient water let into the diving tanks to lower us about a foot, and then I ran the bow slowly toward the shore, confident that should we run aground, we still had sufficient lifting force to free us when the water should be pumped out of the tanks, but the bow nosed its way gently into the reeds and touched the shore with the keel still clear. My men were all armed now with both rifles and pistols, each having plenty of ammunition. I ordered one of the Germans ashore with a line and sent two of my own men to guard him, for from what little we had seen of Caprona or Kaspak, as we learned later to call the interior, we realized that any instant some new and terrible danger might confront us. The line was made fast to a small tree, and at the same time I had the stern anchor dropped. As soon as the Bosch and his guard were aboard again, I called all hands on deck, including von Schoenvorts, and there I explained to them that the time had come for us to enter into some sort of an agreement among ourselves that would relieve us of the annoyance and embarrassment of being divided into two antagonistic parts, prisoners and captors. I told them that it was obvious our very existence depended upon our unity of action, that we were to all intent and purpose entering a new world as far from the seat and causes of our own world war as if millions of miles of space and eons of time separated us from our past lives and habitations. There is no reason why we should carry our racial and political hatreds into Caprona, I insisted. The Germans among us might kill all the English, or the English might kill the last German, without affecting in the slightest degree either the outcome of even the smallest skirmish upon the Western Front, or the opinion of a single individual in any belligerent or neutral country. I therefore put the issue squarely to you all. Shall we bury our animosities and work together with and for one another while we remain upon Caprona? Or must we continue thus divided and but half-armed, possibly until death has claimed the last of us? And let me tell you, if you have not already realized it, 
the chances are a thousand to one that not one of us ever will see the outside world again. We are safe now in the matter of food and water. We could provision the U-33 for a long cruise, but we are practically out of fuel, and without fuel we cannot hope to reach the ocean as only a submarine can pass through the barrier cliffs. What is your answer? I turned toward von Schoenvoort. He eyed me in that disagreeable way of his, and demanded to know, in case they accepted my suggestion, what their status would be in event of our finding a way to escape with the U-33. I replied that I felt that if we had all worked loyally together, we should leave Caprona upon a common footing, and to that end I suggested that should the remote possibility of our escape in the submarine develop into reality, we should then immediately make for the nearest neutral port and give ourselves into the hands of the authorities when we should all probably be interned for the duration of the war. To my surprise, he agreed that this was fair and told me that they would accept my conditions and that I could depend upon their loyalty to the common cause. I thanked him and then addressed each one of his men individually and each gave me his word that he would abide by all that I had outlined. It was further understood that we were to act as a military organization under military rules and discipline, I as commander, with Bradley as my first lieutenant and Olsen as my second in command of the Englishman, while von Schoenvoort was to act as an additional second lieutenant and have charge of his own men. The four of us were to constitute a military court under which men might be tried and sentenced to punishment for infraction of military rules and discipline even to the passing of the death sentence. I then had arms and ammunition issued to the Germans, and leaving Bradley and five men to guard the U-33, the balance of us went ashore. The first thing we did was to taste the water of the little stream, which, to our delight, we found sweet, pure and cold. This stream was entirely free from dangerous reptiles because, as I later discovered, they became immediately dormant when subjected to a much lower temperature than 70 degrees Fahrenheit. They dislike cold water and keep as far away from it as possible. There were countless brook trout here and deep holes that invited us to bathe, and along the bank of the stream were trees bearing a close resemblance to ash and beech and oak, their characteristics evidently induced by the lower temperature of the air above the cold water and by the fact that their roots were watered by the water from the stream rather than from the warm springs which we afterward found in such abundance elsewhere. Our first concern was to fill the water tanks of the U-33 with fresh water and that having been accomplished, we set out to hunt for game and explore inland for a short distance. Olsen von Schoenvoorts Two Englishmen and two Germans accompanied me, leaving ten to guard the ship and the girl. I had intended leaving Nobbs behind, but he got away and joined me, and was so happy over it that I hadn't the heart to send him back. We followed the stream upward through a beautiful country for about five miles, and then came upon its source in a little boulder-strewn clearing. From among the rocks bubbled fully twenty ice-cold springs, North of the clearing rose sandstone cliffs to a height of some fifty to seventy-five feet, with tall trees growing at their base and almost concealing them from our view. To the west, the country was flat and sparsely wooded, and here it was that we saw our first game, a large red deer. It was grazing away from us and had not seen us when one of my men called my attention to it. Motioning for silence and having the rest of the party lie down, I crept toward the quarry, accompanied only by Whiteley. We got within a hundred yards of the deer when he suddenly raised his antlered head and pricked up his great ears. We both fired at once and had the satisfaction of seeing the buck drop, then we ran forward to finish him with our knives. The deer lay in a small open space close to a clump of acacias, and we had advanced to within several yards of our kill when we both halted suddenly and simultaneously. Whiteley looked at me, and I looked at Whiteley, and then we both looked back in the direction of the deer. Blime, he said. What is hit, sir? It looks to me, Whiteley, like an error, I said. Some assistant god who had been creating elephants must have been temporarily transferred to the lizard department. 
I wouldn't sigh that, sir, said Whiteley. It sounds blasphemous. It is no more blasphemous than that thing which is swiping our meat, I replied, for whatever the thing was, it had leaped upon our deer and was devouring it in great mouthfuls which it swallowed without mastication. The creature appeared to be a great lizard at least ten feet high, with a huge, powerful tail as long as its torso, mighty hind legs and short forelegs. When it had advanced from the wood, it hopped much after the fashion of a kangaroo, using its hind feet and tail to propel it, and when it stood erect, it sat upon its tail. Its head was long and thick, with a blunt muzzle, and the opening of the jaws ran back to a point behind the eyes, and the jaws were armed with long, sharp teeth. The scaly body was covered with black and yellow spots, about a foot in diameter and irregular in contour. These spots were outlined in red with edgings about an inch wide. The underside of the chest, body and tail were a greenish white. What see we pot the blooming bird, sir? suggested Whiteley. I told him to wait until I gave the word. Then we would fire simultaneously, he at the heart and I at the spine. Hat the art, sir. Yes, sir, he replied and raised his piece to his shoulder. Our shots rang out together. The thing raised its head and looked about until its eyes rested upon us. Then it gave vent to a most appalling hiss that rose to the crescendo of a terrific shriek and came for us. Beat it, Whiteley, I cried as I turned to run. We were about a quarter of a mile from the rest of our party and in full sight of them as they lay in the tall grass watching us. That they saw all that had happened was evidenced by the fact that they now rose and ran toward us and at their head leaped Nobs. The creature in our rear was gaining on us rapidly when Nobs flew past me like a meteor and rushed straight for the frightful reptile. I tried to recall him, but he would pay no attention to me, and as I couldn't see him sacrificed, I too stopped and faced the monster. The creature appeared to be more impressed with Nobs than by us and our firearms, for it stopped as the Airedale dashed at it growling and struck at him viciously with its powerful jaws. Nobs, though, was lightning by comparison with the slow thinking beast and dodged his opponent's thrust with ease. Then he raced to the rear of the tremendous thing and seized it by the tail. There, Nobs made the error of his life. Within that mottled organ were the muscles of a titan, the force of a dozen mighty catapults, and the owner of the tail was fully aware of the possibilities which it contained. With a single flip of the tip, it sent poor Nobs sailing through the air a hundred feet above the ground, straight back into the clump of acacias from which the beast had leaped upon our kill. And then the grotesque thing sank lifeless to the ground. Olsen and von Schoenvorts came up a minute later with their men. Then we all cautiously approached the still form upon the ground. The creature was quite dead, and an examination resulted in disclosing the fact that Whiteley's bullet had pierced its heart, and mine had severed the spinal cord. But why didn't it die instantly? I exclaimed. Because, said von Schoenvorts in his disagreeable way, the beast is so large and its nervous organization of so low a caliber that it took all this time for the intelligence of death to reach and be impressed upon the minute brain. The thing was dead when your bullet struck it, but it did not know it for several seconds, possibly a minute. If I am not mistaken, it is an Allosaurus of the Upper Jurassic, remains of which have been found in central Wyoming in the suburbs of New York. An Irishman by the name of Brady grinned. I afterward learned that he had served three years on the traffic squad of the Chicago police force. I had been calling Nobs in the meantime and was about to set out in search of him, fearing, to tell the truth, to do so lest I find him mangled and dead among the trees of the Acacia Grove when he suddenly emerged from among the bowls, his ears flattened, his tail between his legs and his body screwed into a suppliant S. He was unharmed except for minor bruises, but he was the most chastened dog I have ever seen. We gathered up what was left of the red deer after skinning and cleaning it and set out upon our return journey toward the U-boat. On the way, Olsen, von Schoenvorts and I discussed the needs of our immediate future and we were unanimous in placing foremost the necessity of a permanent camp on shore. 
the interior of a U-boat is about as impossible and uncomfortable an abiding place as one can well imagine, and in this warm climate and in warm water it was almost unendurable. So we decided to construct a palisaded camp. Chapter 6 As we strolled slowly back toward the boat, planning and discussing this, we were suddenly startled by a loud and unmistakable detonation. A shell from the U-33, exclaimed von Schoenvoort. What can be after signifying, queried Olsen. They are in trouble, I answered for all, and it's up to us to get back to them. Drop that carcass, I directed the men carrying the meat, and follow me. I set off at a rapid run in the direction of the harbour. We ran for the better part of a mile without hearing anything more from the direction of the harbour, and then I reduced the speed to a walk, for the exercise was telling on us who had been cooped up for so long in the confined interior of the U-33. Puffing and panting, we plodded on until within about a mile of the harbour we came upon a sight that brought us all up standing. We had been passing through a little heavier timber than was usual to this part of the country, when we suddenly emerged into an open space in the centre of which was such a band as might have caused the most courageous to pause. It consisted of upward of five hundred individuals, representing several species closely allied to man. There were anthropoid apes and gorillas, these I had no difficulty in recognising, but there were other forms which I had never before seen, and I was hard put to it to say whether they were ape or man. Some of them resembled the corpse we had found upon the narrow beach against Caprona's seawall, while others were of a still lower type, more nearly resembling the apes, and yet others were uncannily manlike, standing there erect, being less hairy and possessing better-shaped heads. There was one among the lot, evidently the leader of them, who bore a close resemblance to the so-called Neanderthal man of La Chapelle au Saint. There was the same short, stocky trunk upon which rested an enormous head habitually bent forward into the same curvature as the back, the arms shorter than the legs, and the lower leg considerably shorter than that of modern man, the knees bent forward and never straightened. This creature and one or two others, who appeared to be of a lower order than he, yet higher than that of the apes, carried heavy clubs. The others were armed only with giant muscles and fighting fangs, nature's weapons. All were males, and all were entirely naked, nor was there upon even the highest among them a sign of ornamentation. At sight of us they turned with bared fangs and low growls to confront us. I did not wish to fire among them unless it became absolutely necessary, and so I started to lead my party around them. But the instant that the Neanderthal man guessed my intention, he evidently attributed it to cowardice upon our part, and with a wild cry he leaped toward us, waving his cudgel above his head. The others followed him, and in a minute we should have been overwhelmed. I gave the order to fire, and at the first volley six of them went down including the Neanderthal man. The others hesitated a moment and then broke for the trees, some running nimbly among the branches while others lost themselves to us between the boles. Both von Schoenvorts and I noticed that at least two of the higher man-like types took to the trees quite as nimbly as the apes, while others that more nearly approached man in carriage and appearance sought safety upon the ground with the gorillas. An examination disclosed that five of our erstwhile opponents were dead, and the sixth, the Neanderthal man, was but slightly wounded, a bullet having glanced from his thick skull, stunning him. We decided to take him with us to camp, and by means of belts, we managed to secure his hands behind his back and place a leash around his neck before he regained consciousness. We then retraced our steps for our meat, being convinced by our own experience that those aboard the U-33 had been able to frighten off this party with a single shell, but when we came to where we had left the deer, it had disappeared. On the return journey, Whiteley and I preceded the rest of the party by about a hundred yards, in the hope of getting another shot at something edible, for we were all greatly disgusted and disappointed by the loss of our venison. Whiteley and I advanced very cautiously, and not having the whole party with us, we fared better than on the journey out, 
bagging two large antelope not a half mile from the harbour. So with our game and our prisoner, we made a cheerful return to the boat, where we found that all were safe. On the shore, a little north of where we lay there, were the corpses of twenty of the wild creatures who had attacked Bradley and his party in our absence, and the rest of whom we had met and scattered a few minutes later. We felt that we had taught these wild ape-men a lesson, and that because of it we would be safer in the future, at least safer from them. But we decided not to abate our carefulness one whit, feeling that this new world was filled with terrors still unknown to us, nor were we wrong. The following morning we commenced work upon our camp, Bradley, Olsen, von Schoenvorts, Miss LaRue and I, having sat up half the night discussing the matter and drawing plans. We set the men at work, felling trees, selecting for the purpose Jara, a hard, weather-resisting timber which grew in profusion nearby. Half the men labored while the other half stood guard, alternating each hour with an hour off at noon. Olsen directed this work. Bradley, von Schoenvorts and I, with Miss LaRue's help, staked out the various buildings and the outer wall. When the day was done, we had quite an array of logs nicely notched and ready for our building operations on the morrow, and we were all tired, for after the buildings had been staked out, we all fell in and helped with the logging, all but von Schoenvorts. He, being a Prussian and a gentleman, couldn't stoop to such menial labour in the presence of his men, and I didn't see fit to ask it of him, as the work was purely voluntary upon our part. He spent the afternoon shaping a swagger stick from the branch of Jara and talking with Miss LaRue, who had sufficiently unbent toward him to notice his existence. We saw nothing of the wild men of the previous day, and only once were we menaced by any of the strange denizens of Caprona when some frightful nightmare of the sky swooped down upon us, only to be driven off by a fusillade of bullets. The thing appeared to be some variety of pterodactyl, and what with its enormous size and ferocious aspect was most awe-inspiring. There was another incident, too, which to me at least was far more unpleasant than the sudden onslaught of the prehistoric reptile. Two of the men, both Germans, were stripping a felled tree of its branches. Von Schoenvorts had completed his swagger stick, and he and I were passing close to where the two worked. One of them threw to his rear a small branch that he had just chopped off, and as misfortune would have it, it struck von Schoenvorts across the face. It couldn't have hurt him, for it didn't leave a mark, but he flew into a terrific rage, shouting, Attention! in a loud voice. The sailor immediately straightened up, faced his officer, clicked his heels together, and saluted. Pig! roared the baron, and struck the fellow across the face, breaking his nose. I grabbed von Schoenvorts' arm and jerked him away before he could strike again, if such had been his intention, and then he raised his little stick to strike me. But before it descended, the muzzle of my pistol was against his belly, and he must have seen in my eyes that nothing would suit me better than an excuse to pull the trigger. Like all his kind and all other bullies, von Schoenvorts was a coward at heart, and so he dropped his hand to his side and started to turn away. But I pulled him back, and there before his men I told him that such a thing must never again occur that no man was to be struck or otherwise punished other than in due process of the laws that we had made and the court that we had established. All the time the sailor stood rigidly at attention, nor could I tell from his expression whether he most resented the blow his officer had struck him or my interference in the gospel of the Kaiser breed. Nor did he move until I said to him, Plesser, you may return to your quarters and dress your wound. Then he saluted and marched stiffly off toward the U-33. Just before dusk we moved out into the bay a hundred yards from shore and dropped anchor, for I felt that we should be safer there than elsewhere. I also detailed men to stand watch during the night and appointed Olsen officer of the watch for the entire night, telling him to bring his blankets on deck and get what rest he could. At dinner we tasted our first roast caprona antelope, and we had a mess of greens that the cook had found growing along the stream. All during the meal, von Schoenvorts was silent and surly. After dinner, we all went on deck and watched the unfamiliar scenes of a Capronian night, that is, all but von Schoenvorts. 
there was less to see than to hear. From the great inland lake behind us came the hissing and the screaming of countless saurians. Above us we heard the flap of giant wings, while from the shore rose the multitudinous voices of a tropical jungle, of a warm, damp atmosphere such as must have enveloped the entire earth during the Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras. But here were intermingled the voices of later eras, the scream of the panther, the roar of the lion, the baying of wolves, and a thunderous growling which we could attribute to nothing earthly, but which one day we were to connect with the most fearsome of ancient creatures. One by one the others went to their rooms, until the girl and I were left alone together, for I had permitted the watch to go below for a few minutes, knowing that I would be on deck. Miss LaRue was very quiet, though she replied graciously enough to whatever I had to say that required reply. I asked her if she did not feel well. Yes, she said, but I am depressed by the awfulness of it all. I feel of so little consequence, so small and helpless in the face of all these myriad manifestations of life, stripped to the bone of its savagery and brutality. I realize, as never before, how cheap and valueless a thing is life. Life seems a joke, a cruel, grim joke. You are a laughable incident, or a terrifying one, as you happen to be less powerful or more powerful than some other form of life which crosses your path. But as a rule, you are of no moment whatsoever to anything but yourself. You are a comic little figure, hopping from the cradle to the grave. Yes, that is our trouble. We take ourselves too seriously, but Caprona should be a sure cure for that. She paused and laughed. You have evolved a beautiful philosophy, I said. It fills such a longing in the human breast. It is full, it is satisfying, it is ennobling. What wondrous strides toward perfection the human race might have made if the first man had evolved it, and it had persisted until now as the creed of humanity. I don't like irony, she said. It indicates a small soul. What other sort of soul, then, would you expect from a comic little figure hopping from the cradle to the grave? I inquired. And what difference does it make, anyway, what you like and what you don't like? You are here for but an instant, and you mustn't take yourself too seriously. She looked up at me with a smile. I imagine that I am frightened and blue, she said, and I know that I am very, very homesick and lonely. There was almost a sob in her voice as she concluded. It was the first time that she had spoken thus to me. Involuntarily, I laid my hand upon hers where it rested on the rail. I know how difficult your position is, I said, but don't feel that you are alone. There is, is one here who, who would do anything in the world for you, I ended lamely. She did not withdraw her hand, and she looked up into my face with tears on her cheeks, and I read in her eyes the thanks her lips could not voice. Then she looked away across the weird moonlit landscape and sighed. Evidently, her newfound philosophy had tumbled about her ears, for she was seemingly taking herself seriously. I wanted to take her in my arms and tell her how I loved her, and had taken her hand from the rail and started to draw her toward me when Olsen came blundering up on deck with his bedding. The following morning we started building operations in earnest, and things progressed finely. The Neanderthal man was something of a care for we had to keep him in irons all the time, and he was mighty savage when approached. But after a time, he became more docile, and then we tried to discover if he had a language. Lys spent a great deal of time talking to him and trying to draw him out, but for a long while she was unsuccessful. It took us three weeks to build all the houses, which we constructed close by a cold spring some two miles from the harbour. We changed our plans a trifle when it came to building the palisade, for we found a rotted cliff nearby where we could get all the flat building stone we needed, and so we constructed a stone wall entirely around the buildings. It was in the form of a square, with bastions and towers at each corner which would permit an enfilading fire along any side of the fort, and was about 135 feet square on the outside, with walls three feet thick at the bottom and about a foot and a half wide at the top and fifteen feet high. It took a long time to build that wall, and we all turned in 
and helped except von Schoenvoort, who, by the way, had not spoken to me except in the line of official business since our encounter, a condition of armed neutrality which suited me to a T. We have just finished it, the last touches being put on today. I quit about a week ago and commenced working on this chronicle for our strange adventures which will account for any minor errors in chronology which may have crept in. There was so much material that I may have made some mistakes, but I think they are, but minor and few. I see in reading over the last few pages that I neglected to state that Lys finally discovered that the Neanderthal man possessed a language. She has learned to speak it, and so have I to some extent. It was he, his name he says, is Am, or Arm, who told us that this country is called Kaspak. When we asked him how far it extended, he waved both arms about his head in an all-including gesture which took in, apparently, the entire universe. He is more tractable now, and we are going to release him, for he has assured us that he will not permit his fellows to harm us. He calls us Gallus, and says that in a short time he will be a Galu. It is not quite clear to us what he means. He says that there are many Galus north of us, and that as soon as he becomes one, he will go and live with them. Arm went out to hunt with us yesterday, and was much impressed by the ease with which our rifles brought down antelopes and deer. We have been living upon the fat of the land, Arm having shown us the edible fruits, tubers and herbs, and twice a week we go out after fresh meat. A certain proportion of this we dry and store away, for we do not know what may come. Our drying process is really smoking. We have also dried a large quantity of two varieties of cereal which grow wild a few miles south of us. One of these is a giant Indian maize, a lofty perennial often 50 and 60 feet in height, with ears the size of a man's body and kernels as large as your fist. We have had to construct a second storehouse for the great quantity of this that we have gathered. September 3rd, 1916 Three months ago today, the torpedo from the U-33 started me from the peaceful deck of the American liner upon the strange voyage which has ended here in Kaspak. We have settled down to an acceptance of our fate, for all are convinced that none of us will ever see the outer world again. Arm's repeated assertions that there are human beings like ourselves in Kaspak have roused the men to a keen desire for exploration. I sent out one party last week under Bradley. Arm who is now free to go and come as he wishes, accompanied them. They marched about 25 miles due west, encountering many terrible beasts and reptiles, and not a few man-like creatures whom Arm sent away. Here is Bradley's report of the expedition. Marched 15 miles the first day, camping on the bank of a large stream which runs southward. Game was plentiful, and we saw several varieties which we had not before encountered in Kaspak, just before making camp, we were charged by an enormous woolly rhinoceros, which Plesser dropped with a perfect shot. We had rhinoceros steaks for supper. Am called the thing Attis. It was almost a continuous battle from the time we left the fort until we arrived at camp. The mind of man can scarce conceive the plethora of carnivorous life in this lost world, and their prey, of course, is even more abundant. The second day we marched about ten miles to the foot of the cliffs, passed through dense forests close to the base of the cliffs, saw man-like creatures and a low order of ape in one band, and some of the men swore that there was a white man among them. They were inclined to attack us at first, but a volley from our rifles caused them to change their minds. We scaled the cliffs as far as we could, but near the top they are absolutely perpendicular without any sufficient cleft or protuberance to give hand or foothold. All were disappointed, for we hungered for a view of the ocean and the outside world. We even had a hope that we might see and attract the attention of a passing ship. Our exploration has determined one thing which will probably be of little value to us and never heard of beyond Caprona's walls. This crater was once entirely filled with water. Indisputable evidence of this is on the face of the cliffs. Our return journey occupied two days and was as filled with adventure as usual. We are all becoming accustomed to adventure. It is beginning to pall on us. We suffered no casualties 
and there was no illness. I had to smile as I read Bradley's report. In those four days, he had doubtless passed through more adventures than an African big-game hunter experiences in a lifetime, and yet he covered it all in a few lines. Yes, we are becoming accustomed to adventure. Not a day passes that one or more of us does not face death at least once. Arm taught us a few things that have proved profitable and saved us much ammunition, which it is useless to expend except for food or in the last recourse of self-preservation. Now, when we are attacked by large flying reptiles, we run beneath spreading trees. When land carnivora threaten us, we climb into trees, and we have learned not to fire at any of the dinosaurs unless we can keep out of their reach for at least two minutes after hitting them in the brain or spine or five minutes after puncturing their hearts. It takes them so long to die. To hit them elsewhere is worse than useless, for they do not seem to notice it, and we had discovered that such shots do not kill or even disable them. September 7th, 1916. Much has happened since I last wrote. Bradley is away again on another exploration expedition to the cliffs. He expects to be gone several weeks and to follow along their base in search of a point where they may be scaled. He took Sinclair, Brady, James and Tippett with him. Arm has disappeared. He has been gone about three days but the most startling thing I have on record is that von Schoenvorts and Olsen, while out hunting the other day, discovered oil about 15 miles north of us beyond the sandstone cliffs. Olsen says there is a geyser of oil there, and von Schoenvorts is making preparations to refine it. If he succeeds, we shall have the means for leaving Kaspak and returning to our own world. I can scarce believe the truth of it. We are all elated to the seventh heaven of bliss. Pray God we shall not be disappointed. I have tried on several occasions to broach the subject of my love to Lys, but she will not listen. Chapter 7 October 8th, 1916 This is the last entry I shall make upon my manuscript. When this is done, I shall be through though I may pray that it reaches the haunts of civilized man, my better judgment tells me that it will never be perused by other eyes than mine, and that even though it should, it would be too late to avail me. I am alone upon the summit of the great cliff overlooking the broad Pacific. A chill south wind bites at my marrow, while far below me I can see the tropic foliage of Kaspak on the one hand, and huge icebergs from the near Antarctic upon the other. Presently, I shall stuff my folded manuscript into the thermos bottle I have carried with me for the purpose since I left the fort, Fort Dinosaur we named it, and hurl it far outward over the clifftop into the Pacific. What current washes the shore of Caprona, I know not. Whither my bottle will be borne, I cannot even guess. But I have done all that mortal man may do to notify the world of my whereabouts and the dangers that threaten those of us who remain alive in Kaspak, if there be any other than myself. About the 8th of September, I accompanied Olsen and von Schoenvorts to the oil geyser. Lise came with us, and we took a number of things which von Schoenvorts wanted for the purpose of erecting a crude refinery. We went up the coast some 10 or 12 miles in the U-33, tying up to shore near the mouth of a small stream, which emptied great volumes of crude oil into the sea. I find it difficult to call this great lake by any other name. Then we disembarked and went inland about five miles, where we came upon a small lake entirely filled with oil, from the center of which a geyser of oil spouted. On the edge of the lake, we helped von Schoenvorts build his primitive refinery. We worked with him for two days until he got things fairly well started, and then we returned to Fort Dinosaur, as I feared that Bradley might return and be worried by our absence. The U-33 merely landed those of us that were to return to the fort, and then retraced its course toward the oil well. Olsen, Whiteley, Wilson, Miss LaRue and myself disembarked, while von Schoenvorts and his German crew returned to refine the oil. The next day, Plesser and two other Germans came down overland for ammunition. 
Plesser said they had been attacked by wild men and had exhausted a great deal of ammunition. He also asked permission to get some dried meat and maize, saying that they were so busy with the work of refining that they had no time to hunt. I let him have everything he asked for, and never once did a suspicion of their intentions enter my mind. They returned to the oil well the same day, while we continued with the multitudinous duties of camp life. For three days, nothing of moment occurred. Bradley did not return, nor did we have any word from von Schoenvorts. In the evening, Lise and I went up into one of the bastion towers and listened to the grim and terrible nightlife of the frightful ages of the past. Once a saber-tooth screamed almost beneath us, and the girl shrank close against me. As I felt her body against mine, all the pent love of these three long months shattered the bonds of timidity and conviction, and I swept her up into my arms and covered her face and lips with kisses. She did not struggle to free herself, but instead her dear arms crept up about my neck and drew my own face even closer to hers. You love me, Liz? I cried. I felt her head nod an affirmative against my breast. Tell me, Liz, I begged. Tell me in words how much you love me. Low and sweet and tender came the answer. I love you beyond all conception. My heart filled with rapture then, and it fills now as it has each of the countless times I have recalled those dear words, as it shall fill always until death has claimed me. I may never see her again. She may not know how I love her. She may question, she may doubt, but always true and steady, and warm with the fires of love, my heart beats for the girl who said that night, I love you beyond all conception. For a long time we sat there upon the little bench constructed for the sentry that we had not as yet thought it necessary to post in more than one of the four towers. We learned to know one another better in those two brief hours than we had in all the months that had intervened since we had been thrown together. She told me that she had loved me from the first, and that she never had loved von Schoenvorts, their engagement having been arranged by her aunt for social reasons. That was the happiest evening of my life, nor ever do I expect to experience its like, but at last, as is the way of happiness, it terminated. We descended to the compound, and I walked with Liz to the door of her quarters. There again she kissed me and bade me good night, and then she went in and closed the door. I went to my own room, and there I sat by the light of one of the crude candles we had made from the tallow of the beasts we had killed, and lived over the events of the evening. At last I turned in and fell asleep, dreaming happy dreams and planning for the future, for even in savage Caspak I was bound to make my girl safe and happy. It was daylight when I awoke. Wilson, who was acting as cook, was up and astir at his duties in the cookhouse. The others slept, but I arose and followed by knobs went down to the stream for a plunge. As was our custom, I went armed with both rifle and revolver, but I stripped and had my swim without further disturbance than the approach of a large hyena, a number of which occupied caves in the sandstone cliffs north of the camp. These brutes are enormous and exceedingly ferocious. I imagine they correspond with the cave hyena of prehistoric times. This fellow charged Nobs, whose Capronian experiences had taught him that discretion is the better part of valour, with the result that he dived head foremost into the stream beside me after giving vent to a series of ferocious growls which had no more effect upon Hyena Spileus than might a sweet smile upon an enraged Tusker. Afterward, I shot the beast, and Nobs had a feast while I dressed, for he had become quite a raw meat eater during our numerous hunting expeditions, upon which we always gave him a portion of the kill. Whiteley and Olsen were up and dressed when we returned, and we all sat down to a good breakfast. I could not but wonder at Lise's absence from the table, for she had always been one of the earliest risers in camp. So about nine o'clock, becoming apprehensive lest she might be indisposed, I went to the door of her room and knocked. I received no response, though I finally pounded with all my strength. Then I turned the knob and entered, only to find that she was not there. Her bed had been occupied, and her clothing lay where she had placed it the previous night upon retiring, but Lys was gone. 
To say that I was distracted with terror would be to put it mildly. Though I knew she could not be in camp, I searched every square inch of the compound and all the buildings, yet without avail. It was Whiteley who discovered the first clue, a huge human-like footprint in the soft earth beside the spring and indications of a struggle in the mud. Then I found a tiny handkerchief close to the outer wall. Liss had been stolen. It was all too plain. Some hideous member of the ape-man tribe had entered the fort and carried her off. While I stood stunned and horrified at the frightful evidence before me, there came from the direction of the great lake an increasing sound that rose to the volume of a shriek. We all looked up as the noise approached apparently just above us, and a moment later there followed a terrific explosion which hurled us to the ground. When we clambered to our feet, we saw a large section of the west wall torn and shattered. It was Olsen who first recovered from his daze sufficiently to guess the explanation of the phenomenon. A shell, he cried, and there ain't no shells in Caspak besides what's on the U-33. The dirty Boches are shelling the fort. Come on! And he grasped his rifle and started on a run toward the lake. It was over two miles, but we did not pause until the harbour was in view, and still we could not see the lake because of the sandstone cliffs which intervened. We ran as fast as we could around the lower end of the harbour, scrambled up the cliffs, and at last stood upon their summit in full view of the lake. Far away down the coast, toward the river through which we had come to reach the lake, we saw upon the surface the outline of the U-33, black smoke vomiting from her funnel. Von Schoenvorts had succeeded in refining the oil. The Kerr had broken his every pledge and was leaving us there to our fate. He had even shelled the fort as a parting compliment, nor could anything have been more truly Prussian than this leave-taking of the Baron Friedrich von Schoenvorts. Olsen, Whiteley, Wilson and I stood for a moment looking at one another. It seemed incredible that man could be so perfidious, that we had really seen with our own eyes the thing that we had seen. But when we returned to the fort, the shattered wall gave us ample evidence that there was no mistake. Then we began to speculate as to whether it had been an ape-man or a Prussian that had abducted Les. From what we knew of von Schoenvorts, we would not have been surprised at anything from him. But the footprints by the spring seemed indisputable evidence that one of Caprona's undeveloped men had borne off the girl I loved. As soon as I had assured myself that such was the case, I made my preparations to follow and rescue her. Olsen, Whiteley, and Wilson each wished to accompany me, but I told them that they were needed here, since with Bradley's party still absent, and the Germans gone, it was necessary that we conserve our force as far as might be possible. Chapter 8 It was a sad leave-taking, as in silence I shook hands with each of the three remaining men. Even poor Nobs appeared dejected as we quit the compound and set out upon the well-marked spore of the abductor. Not once did I turn my eyes backward toward Fort Dinosaur. I have not looked upon it since, nor in all likelihood shall I ever look upon it again. The trail led northwest until it reached the western end of the sandstone cliffs to the north of the fort. There it ran into a well-defined path which wound northward into a country we had not as yet explored. It was a beautiful, gently rolling country, broken by occasional outcroppings of sandstone and by patches of dense forest, relieved by open, park-like stretches and broad meadows whereon grazed countless herbivorous animals, red deer, aurochs, and infinite variety of antelope, and at least three distinct species of horse, the latter ranging in size from a creature about as large as knobs to a magnificent animal fourteen to sixteen hands high. These creatures fed together in perfect amity, nor did they show any great indications of terror when knobs and I approached. They moved out of our way and kept their eyes upon us until we had passed. Then they resumed their feeding. The path led straight across the clearing into another forest, lying upon the verge of which I saw a bit of white, it appeared to stand out in marked contrast and incongruity to all its surroundings, and when I stopped to examine it, I found that it was a small strip of muslin, part of the hem of a garment. 
At once I was all excitement, for I knew that it was a sign left by Lys that she had been carried this way. It was a tiny bit torn from the hem of the undergarment that she wore in lieu of the night robes she had lost with the sinking of the liner. Crushing the bit of fabric to my lips, I pressed on even more rapidly than before, because I now knew that I was upon the right trail, and that up to this point at least, Lys still had lived. I made over twenty miles that day, for I was now hardened to fatigue and accustomed to long hikes, having spent considerable time hunting and exploring in the immediate vicinity of camp. A dozen times that day was my life threatened by fearsome creatures of the earth or sky, though I could not but note that the farther north I travelled, the fewer were the great dinosaurs, though they still persisted in lesser numbers. On the other hand, the quantity of ruminants and the variety and frequency of carnivorous animals increased. Each square mile of Kaspak harboured its terrors. At intervals along the way I found bits of muslin, and often they reassured me when otherwise I should have been doubtful of the trail to take where two crossed or where there were forks, as occurred at several points. And so, as night was drawing on, I came to the southern end of a line of cliffs loftier than any I had seen before, and as I approached them, there was wafted to my nostrils the pungent aroma of wood smoke. What could it mean? There could, to my mind, be but a single solution. Man abided close by, a higher order of man than we had as yet seen, other than Arm, the Neanderthal man. I wondered again, as I had so many times that day, if it had not been Arm who stole Lise. But what interested me most was the slender figure of a dainty girl, clad only in a thin bit of muslin which scarce covered her knees, a bit of muslin torn and ragged about the lower hem. It was Lys, and she was alive and so far as I could see, unharmed. A huge brute with thick lips and prognathous jaw stood at her shoulder. He was talking loudly and gesticulating wildly. I was close enough to hear his words, which were similar to the language of Arm, though much fuller, for there were many words I could not understand. However, I caught the gist of what he was saying, which in effect was that he had found and captured this Galu, that she was his, and that he defied anyone to question his right of possession. It appeared to me, as I afterward learned was the fact, that I was witnessing the most primitive of marriage ceremonies. The assembled members of the tribe looked on and listened in a sort of dull and perfunctory apathy, for the speaker was by far the mightiest of the clan. There seemed no one to dispute his claims when he said, or rather shouted in stentorian tones, I am T.S.A. This is my she. Who wishes her more than T.S.A.? I do, I said in the language of arm, and I stepped out into the firelight before them. Lys gave a little cry of joy and started toward me, but T.S.A. grasped her arm and dragged her back. Who are you? shrieked T.S.A. I kill! I kill! I kill! The she is mine, I replied, and I have come to claim her. I kill if you do not let her come to me. And I raised my pistol to a level with his heart. Of course, the creature had no conception of the purpose of the strange little implement which I was poking toward him, with a sound that was half human and half the growl of a wild beast, he sprang toward me. I aimed at his heart and fired, and as he sprawled headlong to the ground, the others of his tribe, overcome by fright at the report of the pistol, scattered toward the cliffs, while Lys, with outstretched arms, ran toward me. As I crushed her to me, there rose from the black night behind us, and then to our right and to our left a series of frightful screams and shrieks, bellowings, roars and growls. It was the nightlife of this jungle world coming into its own, the huge carnivorous nocturnal beasts which make the nights of Kaspak hideous. A shuddering sob ran through Lys's figure. Oh God, she cried, give me the strength to endure for his sake. I saw that she was upon the verge of a breakdown after all that she must have passed through of fear and horror that day, and I tried to quiet and reassure her as best I might, but even to me the future looked most unpromising, for what chance of life had we against the frightful hunters of the night who even now were prowling closer to us? Now I turned to see what had become of the tribe, and in the fitful glare of the fire I perceived that the face of the cliff was pitted with large holes into which the man-things were clambering. 
Come, I said to Lise. We must follow them. We cannot last a half hour out here. We must find a cave. Already we could see the blazing green eyes of the hungry carnivora. I seized a brand from the fire and hurled it out into the night, and there came back an answering chorus of savage and rageful protest, but the eyes vanished for a short time. Selecting a burning branch for each of us, we advanced toward the cliffs where we were met by angry threats. They will kill us, said Les. We may as well keep on in search of another refuge. They will not kill us so surely as will those others out there, I replied. I'm going to seek shelter in one of these caves, nor will the man-things prevent. And I kept on in the direction of the cliff's base. A huge creature stood upon a ledge and brandished his stone hatchet. Come and I will kill you and take the she, he boasted. You saw how TSA fared when he would have kept my she, I replied in his own tongue. Thus will you fare, and all your fellows, if you do not permit us to come in peace among you out of the dangers of the night. Go north, he screamed. Go north among the gallows, and we will not harm you. Some day will we be gallows, but now we are not. You do not belong among us. Go away, or we will kill you. The she may remain if she is afraid, and we will keep her, but the he must depart. The he won't depart, I replied, and approached still nearer. Rough and narrow ledges formed by nature gave access to the upper caves. A man might scale them if unhampered and unhindered, but to clamber upward in the face of a belligerent tribe of half-men and with a girl to assist was beyond my capability. I do not fear you, screamed the creature. You were close to TSA, but I am far above you. You cannot harm me as you harm TSA. Go away! I placed a foot upon the lowest ledge and clambered upward, reaching down and pulling Lys to my side. Already I felt safer. Soon we would be out of danger of the beasts again closing in upon us. The man above us raised his stone hatchet above his head and leaped lightly down to meet us. His position above me gave him a great advantage, or at least so he probably thought, for he came with every show of confidence. I hated to do it, but there seemed no other way, and so I shot him down as I had shot down TSA. You see, I cried to his fellows, that I can kill you wherever you may be. A long way off I can kill you as well as I can kill you nearby. Let us come among you in peace. I will not harm you if you do not harm us. We will take a cave high up. Speak. Come then, said one. If you will not harm us, you may come. Take Tsar's hole, which lies above you. The creature showed us the mouth of a black cave, but he kept at a distance while he did it, and Lys followed me as I crawled in to explore. I had matches with me, and in the light of one I found a small cavern with a flat roof and floor which followed the cleavage of the strata. Pieces of the roof had fallen at some long distant date, as was evidenced by the depth of the filth and rubble in which they were embedded. Even a superficial examination revealed the fact that nothing had ever been attempted that might have improved the livability of the cavern, nor should I judge had it ever been cleaned out. With considerable difficulty, I loosened some of the larger pieces of broken rock which littered the floor and placed them as a barrier before the doorway. It was too dark to do more than this. I then gave Lys a piece of dried meat, and sitting inside the entrance, we dined as must have some of our ancient forebears at the dawning of the Age of Man, while far below the open diapason of the savage night rose weird and horrifying to our ears. In the light of the great fire still burning, we could see huge, skulking forms, and in the blacker background, countless flaming eyes. Lys shuddered, and I put my arm around her and drew her to me, and thus we sat throughout the hot night. She told me of her abduction and of the fright she had undergone, and together we thanked God that she had come through unharmed, because the great brute had dared not pause along the danger-infested way. She said that they had but just reached the cliffs when I arrived, for on several occasions her captor had been forced to take to the trees with her to escape the clutches of some hungry cave lion or saber-toothed tiger, and that twice they had been obliged to remain for considerable periods before the beasts had retired. 
Nobbs, by dint of much scrambling and one or two narrow escapes from death, had managed to follow us up the cliff and was now curled between me and the doorway, having devoured a piece of the dried meat which he seemed to relish immensely. He was the first to fall asleep, but I imagine we must have followed suit soon, for we were both tired. I had laid aside my ammunition belt and rifle, though both were close beside me, but my pistol I kept in my lap beneath my hand. However, we were not disturbed during the night, and when I awoke, the sun was shining on the treetops in the distance. Lise's head had drooped to my breast, and my arm was still about her. Shortly afterward, Lise awoke, and for a moment she could not seem to comprehend her situation. She looked at me, and then turned and glanced at my arm about her, and then she seemed quite suddenly to realize the scantiness of her apparel and drew away, covering her face with her palms and blushing furiously. I drew her back toward me and kissed her, and then she threw her arms about my neck and wept softly in mute surrender to the inevitable. It was an hour later before the tribe began to stir about. We watched them from our apartment, as Lys called it, Neither men nor women wore any sort of clothing or ornaments, and they all seemed to be about of an age, nor were there any babies or children among them. This was, to us, the strangest and most inexplicable of facts, but it recalled to us that though we had seen many of the lesser developed wild people of Kaspak, we had never yet seen a child or an old man or woman. After a while they became less suspicious of us, and then quite friendly in their brutish way. They picked at the fabric of our clothing, which seemed to interest them, and examined my rifle and pistol and the ammunition in the belt around my waist. I showed them the thermos bottle, and when I poured a little water from it, they were delighted, thinking that it was a spring which I carried about with me, a never-failing source of water supply. One thing we both noticed among their other characteristics, they never laughed nor smiled, and then we remembered that Aham had never done so either. I asked them if they knew Arm, but they said they did not. One of them said, Back there, we may have known him. And he jerked his head to the south. You came from back there? I asked. He looked at me in surprise. We all come from there, he said. After a while, we go there. And this time, he jerked his head toward the north. Be Gallus, he concluded. Many times now had we heard this reference to becoming Gallus. Arm had spoken of it many times. Lise and I decided that it was a sort of original religious conviction, as much a part of them as their instinct for self-preservation, a primal acceptance of a hereafter and a holier state. It was a brilliant theory, but it was all wrong. I know it now, and how far we were from guessing the wonderful, the miraculous, the gigantic truth which even yet I may only guess at. The thing that sets Kaspak apart from all the rest of the world far more definitely than her isolated geographical position or her impregnable barrier of giant cliffs. If I could live to return to civilization, I should have meat for the clergy and the layman to chew upon for years, and for the evolutionists too. After breakfast, the men set out to hunt, while the women went to a large pool of warm water covered with a green scum and filled with billions of tadpoles. They waded in to where the water was about a foot deep and lay down in the mud. They remained there from one to two hours and then returned to the cliff. While we were with them, we saw this same thing repeated every morning. But though we asked them why they did it, we could get no reply which was intelligible to us. All they vouchsafed in way of explanation was the single word utter. They tried to get Lys to go in with them and could not understand why she refused. After the first day I went hunting with the men, leaving my pistol and knobs with Lys. But she never had to use them, for no reptile or beast ever approached the pool while the women were there, nor, so far as we know, at other times. There was no spore of wild beast in the soft mud along the banks, and the water certainly didn't look fit to drink. This tribe lived largely upon the smaller animals which they bowled over with their stone hatchets after making a wide circle about their quarry and driving it so that it had to pass close to one of their number. The little horses and the smaller antelope they secured in sufficient numbers to support life, 
and they also ate numerous varieties of fruits and vegetables. They never brought in more than sufficient food for their immediate needs. But why bother? The food problem of Kaspak is not one to cause worry to her inhabitants. The fourth day, Lys told me that she thought she felt equal to attempting the return journey on the morrow, and so I set out for the hunt in high spirits, for I was anxious to return to the fort and learn if Bradley and his party had returned, and what had been the result of his expedition. I also wanted to relieve their minds as to Lys and myself, as I knew that they must have already given us up for dead. It was a cloudy day, though warm as it always is in Kaspak. It seemed odd to realize that just a few miles away winter lay upon the storm-tossed ocean and that snow might be falling all about Caprona, but no snow could ever penetrate the damp, hot atmosphere of the great crater. We had to go quite a bit farther than usual before we could surround a little bunch of antelope, and as I was helping drive them, I saw a fine red deer a couple of hundred yards behind me. He must have been asleep in the long grass, for I saw him rise and look about him in a bewildered way, and then I raised my gun and let him have it. He dropped, and I ran forward to finish him with the long, thin knife which one of the men had given me. But just as I reached him, he staggered to his feet and ran on for another two hundred yards when I dropped him again. Once more was this repeated before I was able to reach him and cut his throat, then I looked around for my companions as I wanted them to come and carry the meat home, but I could see nothing of them. I called a few times and waited, but there was no response and no one came. At last I became disgusted, and cutting off all the meat that I could conveniently carry, I set off in the direction of the cliffs. I must have gone about a mile before the truth dawned upon me. I was lost, hopelessly lost. The entire sky was still completely blotted out by dense clouds, nor was there any landmark visible by which I might have taken my bearings. I went on in the direction I thought was south, but which I now imagine must have been about due north, without detecting a single familiar object. In a dense wood, I suddenly stumbled upon a thing which at first filled me with hope, and later with the most utter despair and dejection. It was a little mound of new-turned earth sprinkled with flowers long since withered, and at one end was a flat slab of sandstone stuck in the ground. It was a grave, and it meant for me that I had at last stumbled into a country inhabited by human beings. I would find them. They would direct me to the cliffs. Perhaps they would accompany me and take us back with them to their abodes, to the abodes of men and women like ourselves. My hopes and my imagination ran riot in the few yards I had to cover to reach that lonely grave and stoop that I might read the rude characters scratched upon the simple headstone. This is what I read. Here lies John Tippett, Englishman, killed by Tyrannosaurus the 10th of September. A.D. 1916. Rip. Tippett. It seemed incredible. Tippett lying here in this gloomy wood. Tippett dead. He had been a good man, but the personal loss was not what affected me. It was the fact that this silent grave gave evidence that Bradley had come this far upon his expedition, and that he too probably was lost, for it was not our intention that he should be long gone. If I had stumbled upon the grave of one of the party, was it not within reason to believe that the bones of the others lay scattered somewhere near? Chapter 9 as I stood looking down upon that sad and lonely mound, wrapped in the most dismal of reflections and premonitions, I was suddenly seized from behind and thrown to earth. As I fell, a warm body fell on top of me, and hands grasped my arms and legs. When I could look up, I saw a number of giant figures pinioning me down, while others stood about surveying me. Here again was a new type of man a higher type than the primitive tribe I had just quitted. They were a taller people too, with better shaped skulls and more intelligent faces. There were less of the ape characteristics about their features and less of the negroid too. They carried weapons, stone-shod spears, stone knives and hatchets, and they wore ornaments and breechcloths, the former of feathers worn in their hair and the latter made of a single snakeskin cured with the head on the head depending to their knees. 
Of course, I did not take in all these details upon the instant of my capture, for I was busy with other matters. Three of the warriors were sitting upon me, trying to hold me down by main strength and awkwardness, and they were having their hands full in the doing, I can tell you. I don't like to appear conceited, but I may as well admit that I am proud of my strength and the science that I have acquired and developed in the directing of it. That, and my horsemanship, I always have been proud of. And now, that day, all the long hours that I had put into careful study, practice and training brought me in two or three minutes a full return upon my investment. Californians, as a rule, are familiar with jujutsu, and I especially had made a study of it for several years, both at school and in the gym of the Los Angeles Athletic Club, while recently I had had, in my employ, a Jap who was a wonder at the art. It took me just about 30 seconds to break the elbow of one of my assailants, trip another, and send him stumbling backward among his fellows, and throw the third completely over my head in such a way that when he fell his neck was broken. In the instant that the others of the party stood in mute and inactive surprise, I unslung my rifle, which carelessly I had been carrying across my back, and when they charged, as I felt they would, I put a bullet in the forehead of one of them. This stopped them all temporarily, not the death of their fellow, but the report of the rifle, the first they had ever heard. Before they were ready to attack me again, one of them spoke in a commanding tone to his fellows, and in a language similar but still more comprehensive than that of the tribe to the south, as theirs was more complete than arms. He commanded them to stand back, and then he advanced and addressed me. He asked me who I was, from whence I came, and what my intentions were. I replied that I was a stranger in Kaspak, that I was lost, and that my only desire was to find my way back to my companions. He asked where they were, and I told him toward the south somewhere, using the Kaspakian phrase which, literally translated, means toward the beginning. His surprise showed upon his face before he voiced it in words. There are no Gallus there, he said. I tell you, I said angrily, that I am from another country, far from Kaspak, far beyond the high cliffs. I do not know who the Gallus may be. I have never seen them. This is the farthest north I have been. Look at me. Look at my clothing and my weapons. Have you ever seen a Galu or any other creature in Kaspak who possessed such things? He had to admit that he had not, and also that he was much interested in me, my rifle, and the way I had handled his three warriors. Finally, he became half convinced that I was telling him the truth, and offered to aid me if I would show him how I had thrown the man over my head and also make him a present of the bang spear, as he called it. I refused to give him my rifle, but promised to show him the trick he wished to learn if he would guide me in the right direction. He told me that he would do so tomorrow, that it was too late today, and that I might come to their village and spend the night with them. I was loath to lose so much time, but the fellow was obdurate, and so I accompanied them. The two dead men they left where they had fallen, nor gave them a second glance. Thus, cheap is life upon Kaspak. These people also were cave dwellers, but their caves showed the result of a higher intelligence that brought them a step nearer to civilized man than the tribe next, toward the beginning. The interiors of their caverns were cleared of rubbish, though still far from clean, and they had pallets of dried grasses covered with the skins of leopard, lynx, and bear, while before the entrances were barriers of stone and small, rudely circular stone ovens. The walls of the cavern to which I was conducted were covered with drawings scratched upon the sandstone. There were the outlines of the giant red deer, of mammoths, of tigers, and other beasts. Here, as in the last tribe, there were no children or any old people. The men of this tribe had two names, or rather names of two syllables, and their language contained words of two syllables, whereas in the tribe of TSA the words were all of a single syllable, with the exception of a very few like Attis and Gallus. The chief's name was Tojo, and his household consisted of seven females and himself. These women were much more comely, or rather less hideous, than those of Tsar's people. One of them, even, was almost pretty, 
being less hairy and having a rather nice skin with high colouring. They were all much interested in me and examined my clothing and equipment carefully, handling and feeling and smelling of each article. I learned from them that their people were known as Bandlu or Spearmen. Tiar's race was called Stolu, Hatchetmen. Below these in the scale of evolution came the Bolu or Clubmen and then the Alus, who had no weapons and no language. In that word I recognized what to me seemed the most remarkable discovery I had made upon Caprona, for unless it were mere coincidence, I had come upon a word that had been handed down from the beginning of spoken language upon earth, been handed down for millions of years perhaps, with little change. It was the sole remaining thread of the ancient woof of a dawning culture which had been woven when Caprona was a fiery mount upon a great landmass teeming with life. It linked the unfathomable then to the eternal now, and yet it may have been pure coincidence. My better judgment tells me that it is coincidence that in Caspak the term for speechless man is Alus, and in the outer world of our own day it is Alalus. The comely woman of whom I spoke was called Sota, and she took such a lively interest in me that Tojo finally objected to her attentions, emphasizing his displeasure by knocking her down and kicking her into a corner of the cavern. I leapt between them while he was still kicking her, and obtaining a quick hold upon him, dragged him screaming with pain from the cave. Then I made him promise not to hurt the she again upon pain of worse punishment. Sotar gave me a grateful look, but Tojo and the balance of his women were sullen and ominous. Later in the evening, Sotar confided to me that she was soon to leave the tribe. Sotar soon to be Krolu, she confided in a low whisper. I asked her what a Krolu might be, and she tried to explain, but I do not yet know if I understood her. From her gestures, I deduced that the Krolus were a people who were armed with bows and arrows, had vessels in which to cook their food and huts of some sort in which they lived, and were accompanied by animals. It was all very fragmentary and vague, but the idea seemed to be that the Krolus were a more advanced people than the Bandlus. I pondered a long time upon all that I had heard, before sleep came to me. I tried to find some connection between these various races that would explain the universal hope which each of them harbored that some day they would become Gallus. Sotar had given me a suggestion, but the resulting idea was so weird that I could scarce even entertain it, yet it coincided with Arm's expressed hope, with the various steps in evolution I had noted in the several tribes I had encountered, and with the range of type represented in each tribe. For example, among the Banlu were such types as Sota, who seemed to me to be the highest in the scale of evolution, and Tojo, who was just a shade nearer the ape, while there were others who had flatter noses, more prognathous faces, and hairier bodies. The question puzzled me. Possibly in the outer world the answer to it is locked in the bosom of the Sphinx. Who knows? I do not. I, thinking the thoughts of a lunatic or a dope fiend, I fell asleep, and when I awoke, my hands and feet were securely tied, and my weapons had been taken from me. How they did it, without awakening me, I cannot tell you. It was humiliating, but it was true. To Joe stood above me. The early light of morning was dimly filtering into the cave. Tell me, he demanded, how to throw a man over my head and break his neck, for I am going to kill you and I wish to know this thing before you die. Of all the ingenuous declarations I've ever heard, this one copped the proverbial bun. It struck me as so funny that, even in the face of death, I laughed. Death, I may remark here, had, however, lost much of his terror for me. I had become a disciple of Lys's fleeting philosophy of the valuelessness of human life. I realized that she was quite right, that we were but comic figures hopping from the cradle to the grave, of interest to practically no other created thing than ourselves and our few intimates. Behind Tojo stood Sota. She raised one hand with the palm toward me, the Kaspakian equivalent of a negative shake of the head. Let me think about it, I parried, and Tojo said that he would wait until night. He would give me a day to think it over. Then he left, and the women left the men for the hunt, 
and the women, as I later learned from Sota, for the warm pool where they immersed their bodies, as did the shes of the Stolu. Ata, explained Sota, when I questioned her as to the purpose of this matutinal rite. But that was later. I must have lain there bound and uncomfortable for two or three hours, when at last Sota entered the cave. She carried a sharp knife, mine in fact, and with it she cut my bonds. Come, she said, Sota will go with you back to the Galus. It is time that Sota left the Bandlu. Together we will go to the Krolu, and after that the Galus. Tojo will kill you tonight. He will kill Sota if he knows that Sota aided you. We will go together. I will go with you to the Krolu, I replied. But then I must return to my own people, toward the beginning. You cannot go back, she said. It is forbidden. They would kill you. Thus far have you come. There is no returning. But I must return, I insisted. My people are there. I must return and lead them in this direction. She insisted, and I insisted. But at last, we compromised. I was to escort her as far as the country of the Krolu, and then I was to go back after my own people and lead them north into a land where the dangers were fewer and the people less murderous. She brought me all my belongings that had been filched from me, rifle, ammunition, knife, and thermos bottle, and then hand in hand we descended the cliff and set off toward the north. For three days we continued upon our way until we arrived outside a village of thatched huts just at dusk. Sota said that she would enter alone. I must not be seen if I did not intend to remain, as it was forbidden that one should return and live after having advanced this far. So she left me. She was a dear girl and a stanch and true comrade, more like a man than a woman. In her simple, barbaric way, she was both refined and chaste. She had been the wife of Tojo. Among the Krolu, she would find another mate after the manner of the strange Kaspakian world. But she told me very frankly that whenever I returned, she would leave her mate and come to me, as she preferred me above all others. I was becoming a ladies' man after a lifetime of bashfulness. At the outskirts of the village, I left her without even seeing the sort of people who inhabited it, and set off through the growing darkness toward the south. On the third day, I made a detour westward to avoid the country of the Bandlu, as I did not care to be detained by a meeting with Tojo. On the sixth day, I came to the cliffs of the Stolu, and my heart beat fast as I approached them, for here was Lys. Soon I would hold her tight in my arms again. Soon her warm lips would merge with mine. I felt sure that she was still safe among the hatchet people, and I was already picturing the joy and the love light in her eyes when she should see me once more as I emerged from the last clump of trees and almost ran toward the cliffs. It was late in the morning. The women must have returned from the pool, yet as I drew near I saw no sign of life whatever. They have remained longer, I thought, but when I was quite close to the base of the cliffs, I saw that which dashed my hopes and my happiness to earth. Strewn along the ground were a score of mute and horrible suggestions of what had taken place during my absence. Bones picked clean of flesh, the bones of man-like creatures, the bones of many of the tribe of Stolu. Nor in any cave was there sign of life. Closely I examined the ghastly remains fearful each instant that I should find the dainty skull that would shatter my happiness for life. But though I searched diligently, picking up every one of the twenty-odd skulls, I found none that was the skull of a creature but slightly removed from the ape. Hope, then, still lived. For another three days I searched north and south, east and west for the hatchetmen of Kaspak, but never a trace of them did I find. It was raining most of the time now, and the weather was as near cold as it ever seems to get on Caprona. At last I gave up the search and set off toward Fort Dinosaur. For a week, a week filled with the terrors and dangers of a primeval world, I pushed on in the direction I thought was south. The sun never shone, the rain scarcely ever ceased falling. The beasts I met with were fewer in number, but infinitely more terrible in temper. 
Yet I lived on until there came to me the realization that I was hopelessly lost, that a year of sunshine would not again give me my bearings. And while I was cast down by this terrifying knowledge, the knowledge that I never again could find Lys, I stumbled upon another grave, the grave of William James, with its little crude headstone and its scrawled characters recording that he had died upon the 13th of September, killed by a saber-toothed tiger. I think that I almost gave up then. Never in my life have I felt more hopeless or helpless or alone. I was lost. I could not find my friends. I did not even know that they still lived. In fact, I could not bring myself to believe that they did. I was sure that Lys was dead. I wanted myself to die, and yet I clung to life, useless and hopeless and harrowing a thing as it had become. I clung to life because some ancient reptilian forebear had clung to life and transmitted to me through the ages the most powerful motive that guided his minute brain, the motive of self-preservation. At last, I came to the Great Barrier Cliffs, and after three days of mad effort, of maniacal effort, I scaled them. I built crude ladders, I wedged sticks in narrow fissures, I chopped toe holds and finger holds with my long knife, but at last I scaled them. Near the summit, I came upon a huge cavern. It is the abode of some mighty winged creature of the Triassic, or rather, it was. Now, it is mine. I slew the thing and took its abode. I reached the summit and looked out upon the broad, grey, terrible Pacific of the far southern winter. It was cold up there. It is cold here today, yet here I sit, watching, watching, watching for the thing I know will never come, for a sail. Chapter 10 once a day I descend to the base of the cliff and hunt, and fill my stomach with water from a clear, cold spring. I have three gourds which I fill with water, and take back to my cave against the long night. I have fashioned a spear and a bow and arrow, that I may conserve my ammunition, which is running low. My clothes are worn to shreds. Tomorrow I shall discard them for leopard skins, which I have tanned and sewn into a garment, strong and warm. It is cold up here. I have a fire burning, and I sit bent over it while I write. But I am safe here. No other living creature ventures to the chill summit of the barrier cliffs. I am safe, and I am alone with my sorrows and my remembered joys, but without hope. It is said that hope springs eternal in the human breast, but there is none in mine. I am about done. Presently I shall fold these pages and push them into my thermos bottle. I shall cork it and screw the cap tight, and then I shall hurl it as far out into the sea as my strength will permit. The wind is offshore, the tide is running out. Perhaps it will be carried into one of those numerous ocean currents which sweep perpetually from pole to pole and from continent to continent to be deposited at last upon some inhabited shore. If fate is kind, and this does happen, then for God's sake, come and get me. It was a week ago that I wrote the preceding paragraph, which I thought would end the written record of my life upon Caprona. I had paused to put a new point on my quill and stir the crude ink, which I made by crushing a black variety of berry and mixing it with water, before attaching my signature, when faintly from the valley far below came an unmistakable sound which brought me to my feet trembling with excitement, to peer eagerly downward from my dizzy ledge. How full of meaning that sound was to me, you may guess when I tell you that it was the report of a firearm. For a moment, my gaze traversed the landscape beneath, until it was caught and held by four figures near the base of the cliff, a human figure held at bay by three hyenodons, those ferocious and bloodthirsty wild dogs of the Eocene. A fourth beast lay dead or dying nearby. I couldn't be sure, looking down from above as I was, but yet I trembled like a leaf in the intuitive belief that it was Lys, and my judgment served to confirm my wild desire, for whoever it was carried only a pistol, and thus had Lys been armed. The first wave of sudden joy which surged through me was short-lived in the face of the swift following conviction that the one who fought below was already doomed. Luck and only luck 
It must have been which had permitted that first shot to lay low one of the savage creatures, for even such a heavy weapon as my pistol is entirely inadequate against even the lesser carnivora of Kaspak. In a moment, the three would charge. A futile shot would but tend more greatly to enrage the one it chanced to hit, and then the three would drag down the little human figure and tear it to pieces. And maybe it was Lys. My heart stood still at the thought, but mind and muscle responded to the quick decision I was forced to make. There was but a single hope, a single chance, and I took it. I raised my rifle to my shoulder and took careful aim. It was a long shot, a dangerous shot, for unless one is accustomed to it, shooting from a considerable altitude is most deceptive work. There is, though, something about marksmanship which is quite beyond all scientific laws. Upon no other theory can I explain my marksmanship of that moment. Three times my rifle spoke, three quick, short syllables of death. I did not take conscious aim, and yet at each report a beast crumpled in its tracks. From my ledge to the base of the cliff is a matter of several thousand feet of dangerous climbing, yet I venture to say that the first ape from whose loins my line has descended never could have equaled the speed with which I literally dropped down the face of that rugged escarpment. The last two hundred feet is over a steep incline of loose rubble to the valley bottom, and I had just reached the top of this when there arose to my ears an agonized cry. Bowen! Bowen! Quick, my love! Quick! I had been too much occupied with the dangers of the descent to glance down toward the valley, but that cry which told me that it was indeed Lys, and that she was again in danger, brought my eyes quickly upon her in time to see a hairy, burly brute seize her and start off at a run toward the nearby wood. From rock to rock, chamois-like, I leaped downward toward the valley in pursuit of Lys and her hideous abductor. He was heavier than I by many pounds, and so weighted by the burden he carried that I easily overtook him, and at last he turned, snarling, to face me. It was Ko of the tribe of TSA, the Hatchet Men. He recognized me, and with a low growl he threw Lys aside and came for me. The she is mine, he cried. I kill, I kill! I had had to discard my rifle before I commenced the rapid descent of the cliff, so that now I was armed only with a hunting knife, and this I whipped from its scabbard as Ko leapt toward me. He was a mighty beast, mightily muscled, and the urge that has made males fight since the dawn of life on earth filled him with the bloodlust and the thirst to slay, but not one whit less did it fill me with the same primal passions. Two abysmal beasts sprang at each other's throats that day beneath the shadow of earth's oldest cliffs, the man of now and the man-thing of the earliest, forgotten then, imbued by the same deathless passion that has come down unchanged through all the epochs, periods, and eras of time from the beginning, and which shall continue to the incalculable end, woman, the imperishable alpha and omega of life. Ko closed and sought my jugular with his teeth. He seemed to forget the hatchet dangling by its oryx hide thong at his hip, as I forgot for the moment the dagger in my hand. And I doubt not, but that Ko would easily have bested me in an encounter of that sort, had not Leif's voice awakened within my momentarily reverted brain the skill and cunning of reasoning man. Bowen, she cried, your knife, your knife. It was enough. It recalled me from the forgotten eon to which my brain had flown and left me once again a modern man battling with a clumsy, unskilled brute. No longer did my jaws snap at the hairy throat before me, but instead my knife sought and found a space between two ribs over the savage heart. Ko voiced a single horrid scream, stiffened spasmodically, and sank to the earth, and Lys threw herself into my arms. All the fears and sorrows of the past were wiped away, and once again I was the happiest of men. With some misgivings, I shortly afterward cast my eyes upward toward the precarious ledge which ran before my cave, for it seemed to me quite beyond all reason to expect a dainty modern belle to essay the perils of that frightful climb. I asked her if she thought she could brave the ascent, and she laughed gaily in my face. Watch, she cried 
and ran eagerly toward the base of the cliff. Like a squirrel, she clambered swiftly aloft so that I was forced to exert myself to keep pace with her. At first, she frightened me, but presently I was aware that she was quite as safe here as was I. When we finally came to my ledge, and I again held her in my arms, she recalled to my mind that for several weeks she had been living the life of a cave girl with the tribe of hatchet men. They had been driven from their former caves by another tribe, which had slain many and carried off quite half the females, and the new cliffs to which they had flown had proven far higher and more precipitous, so that she had become, through necessity, a most practiced climber. She told me of Ko's desire for her, since all his females had been stolen, and of how her life had been a constant nightmare of terror as she sought by night and by day to elude the great brute. For a time, Nobbs had been all the protection she required, but one day he disappeared, nor has she seen him since. She believes that he was deliberately made away with, and so do I, for we both are sure that he never would have deserted her. With her means of protection gone, Lise was now at the mercy of the hatchet man, nor was it many hours before he had caught her at the base of the cliff and seized her, but as he bore her triumphantly aloft toward his cave, she had managed to break loose and escape him. For three days he has pursued me, she said, through this horrible world. How I have passed through in safety I cannot guess, nor how I have always managed to outdistance him. Yet I have done it until just as you discovered me. Fate was kind to us, Bowen. I nodded my head in assent and crushed her to me. And then we talked and planned as I cooked antelope steaks over my fire, and we came to the conclusion that there was no hope of rescue, that she and I were doomed to live and die upon Caprona. Well, it might be worse. I would rather live here always with Lys than to live elsewhere without her. And she, dear girl, says the same of me. But I am afraid of this life for her. It is a hard, fierce, dangerous life, and I shall pray always that we shall be rescued from it for her sake. That night the clouds broke, and the moon shone down upon our little ledge, and there, hand in hand, we turned our faces toward heaven and plighted our troth beneath the eyes of God. No human agency could have married us more sacredly than we are wed. We are man and wife, and we are content. If God wills it, we shall live out our lives here. If he wills otherwise, then this manuscript which I shall now consign to the inscrutable forces of the sea shall fall into friendly hands. However, we are each without hope. And so we say goodbye in this, our last message to the world beyond the barrier cliffs. Hey, sci-fi horror fans, thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. As a fun fact to share, this is part one of a trilogy series by Mr. Edgar Rice Burroughs. Make sure to subscribe if you want to listen to the next two parts, coming soon. A special thanks to our official supporters of the channel. Craving for another scary tale? Click that video on your screen. Until next time, everyone. And remember, stay cosmic.